the top 20 and in the driver's seat atop the Big East. Tech has a steady offense that can pass with accuracy and run with authority behind senior tailback Ken Oxendine. And the hokey speedy defense keeps opponents at bay and off balance and always under pressure. With a win today, Frank Beamer keeps his team's title and bowl hopes on track. Miami and Virginia Tech next. First sign of snow flurries on our football excursion this year as a hurricane blows north through Blacksburg, Virginia. This game is a sellout, so much so they have erected special bleachers to add another thousand fans to Lane Stadium. Hi, everybody. I'm Charlie Steiner along with Todd Christensen, and this is a very important game for the Virginia Tech Hokies, and we will show you why. At the moment, in the Big East, they lead Syracuse. They beat Syracuse earlier in the regular season, 31 to 3. And all they have to do is stay ahead of Syracuse down the stretch, and they'll get into an Alliance Bowl. At the moment, Syracuse is leading Boston College 13 to 10 in the third quarter. So Virginia Tech can ill afford another loss down the stretch, unless they do. And Syracuse hopscotches five places in the polls. Virginia Tech will be home free so they can ill afford a loss tonight. Frank Beamer, when it gets cold around here, his team gets hot. 9-0 and oh in the month of November, dating back to 1994. And Todd, Virginia Tech does it the old-fashioned way. They run it. A very physical team on both sides of the ball, Charlie. Their defense is giving up only 12 points per game, but it is the running tack that is the bellwether of the offense for Virginia Tech, spearheaded by Ken Oxendine. You see his numbers right there, eight touchdowns critical, but he's not the only one in this particular attack. They have three runners who are outstanding, combining, as you can see, for 157 yards per game. There is some outstanding depth in Plattsburgh. Virginia Tech's strength is Miami's weakness, the inability to stop the run, and they're paying for the sins of their fathers. They've lost 31 scholarships over the past three years, and the talent pool is awfully shallow. And where it's affected them the most has been on defense. Not so long ago, in fact, it was 1994 when Miami was the best defense in the country. Since that time, you can see the precipitous fall that has occurred to the Kings. But as you pointed out, Charlie, particularly in the run defense, that's where they have certainly struggled. 91st in the nation. That does not bode well coming into this game. Nonetheless, you need to give a lot of credit to Butch Davis for his optimism and his humor. We put a tourniquet on the bleeding. We're kind of like the patients on ER. We have IVs in both arms and cardiac arrest about every week. But nobody's pulling the plug just yet. Well, the reason for that optimism is because of the last three games. They have really poured it on their opponents to put up some big numbers. And the one that stands out, Charlie, is the 323 rushing yards per game for the Canes. They absolutely have to run tonight to be effective. So it will be up to Miami's offense to keep their defense off the field. And Edgerin James is the man that's going to have to come through for the Canes. Last week against Arkansas State, he had he passed the century mark. He is over 800 yards and 10 touchdowns for the season. As an Edgerin James goes, so goes the passing attack of Ryan Clement. If he can run the ball effectively and get their pass rushers off their white knuckles, they got a chance tonight. We've got Hurricanes and we've got Hokies in Chile, Blacksburg, Virginia. Miami and Virginia Tech coming up next. Judgment Day, two white helmets, both very much in trouble. Welcome everyone, Carl Ravitch in our college football studios. Most figured on this Judgment Day that eyes would be focused. Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Happy Valley, Pennsylvania. And a lot of people forgot about number one, Nebraska. Playing in Columbia, Missouri. Don't forget the Tigers have put up big points their last three games. Victories, all of them. 37, 51, and 41 points. All wins and boy, they showed Nebraska they could score early. Corby Jones to Torrey Coleman, 18-yard touchdown, 14-14. Nebraska had an answer. I'm on green, 21-14. Huskers, but back came Missouri, and this has been the type of game we have seen all afternoon. Jones, Brock Olivo, great run after the 34-yard catch and a touchdown, Missouri by three. Corby Jones with perhaps the best run of the day. This ultimately would cover seven yards. The last one, oh, he gets hit in the back ball across the plane Missouri goes back on top and right now they are up 31 to 28 in the fourth with 14 24 left to go and a chance for number one Nebraska on Judgment Day to get knocked off they
they were not looking at the other two games. They realized that they not only had to win, but win big. If they were going to make an argument to stay at the top of the polls, they're very much in danger of dropping out. Michigan and Penn State, Brian Greasy, Charles Woodson. And this one went from Woodson to the woodshed in a hurry. Michigan, 34, Penn State nothing. The Wolverines have yet to give up a point in the fourth quarter of this season. Last time Penn State was shut out, 1987. And Michigan has completely dominated this one. A chance for them, perhaps, to go to number one. Number six, Washington battling back against Oregon. 24-21, a field goal difference here. It was 24-3 in the second quarter in favor of the Ducks. Number seven, Tennessee battling Southern Miss. Peyton Manning lopping it to the corner. Touchdown, fearless, peerless Price. And that gave the Vols a seven-point lead, but Southern Miss battling as well in the third quarter, just underway. That touchdown pass, the only one Manning has today, though he is 20 of 30 for 191 yards. LSU blanking Alabama at home, 14 to nothing near. Falk over 100 yards, 108, and a touchdown. Purdue in an unbelievable game against Michigan State. We'll show you the highlights at half. Come back to beat them, 22-21. Iowa gets bounced by Wisconsin at home, who had to go most of the game without Ron Dane, 13-10, the final score. Unbeatens are falling by the wayside at start earlier today. Toledo drops to 8-1 as Ball State hammers them, 35-3. Turnovers kill Toledo. They lost four of them. For those of you checking out the Big East, Syracuse only by three over Boston College, 13-10. Pretty good news for those in Blacksburg. Charlie Steiner and Todd Christensen have the call of that one. All right, Carl, so who's number one now with this strange day on Judgment Day? Well, I, I would guess that if Nebraska comes back and can pour on some numbers, they might retain it. But right now, you certainly have to go with Michigan based on the impressive wins that they've had in their schedule. Well, considering the difficulty Nebraska has had with Missouri today and the ease with which Michigan is having its way in Unhappy Valley, you got to like the Wolverines. It is chilly here tonight, a chance of rain. In fact, we're so high up, we're seeing snow flurries at the moment. Winds are relatively calm, should not be a factor, but it is a cold night. How cold is it? Let's go downstairs to the man who knows best, Chris Marlin. Charlie, it's very, very cold right now. It's been raining off and on for the last couple of days. However, the field has been covered, so that won't be a problem. Now, one story we're going to be covering very closely, the performance of the Miami offense. The Canes not only need to score points, but they need to control the ball in order to keep their leaky defense off the field. How does Ryan Clement and the Canes do when they rush for over 100 yards? Very, very well. The Canes are 4-0. Clement throws six TDs, 69%. But when they rush for under 100 yards, everything goes in to the hopper. Owen for 48%, only one touchdown. The key tonight for Miami will be balanced. Now, one injury update. Al Clark, the very good quarterback for Virginia Tech, he did not play last week against Alabama Birmingham because of a bum knee. He is going to start tonight. He may be gimpy, but he's going to give it a go in this very chilly night. Johnny? But this is hokey kind of weather, and every seat has been sold here at Lane Stadium. A crowd of in excess of 50,000. Virginia Tech won the toss, and as we have seen fairly well throughout the year in college football, they have deferred, and so Miami will receive. As you take a look at Butch Davis, who turns 46 next week. In his three years at Miami, the Hurricanes are 21 up and 10 down. They come into the game with a three-game winning streak. They started the year one and four, but they've won three straight. The offensive starting lineup for Miami, Edgerin James. He had runs of 39 and 41 yards last week and has averaged 6.2 yards per carry. He's going to be a vitally important cog in the offense tonight. So too the wide receiver, freshman Reggie Wayne out of Marrera, Louisiana. And the offensive line is anchored by the right tackle, the senior Curlin Blades. So Miami will receive with Santana Moss and Jeff Popovich standing deep. Charlie, you mentioned the weather. We'll be interested to see how Miami reacts to it. It's no secret that they're a warm weather club and very young. 28 of their top 44 players are either freshmen or sophomores. So this is really 
uh, to use a standard cliche. This is a gut check time for the Miami Hurricanes. Popovich is number 33, Santana Moss 48, standing deep as Jimmy Kibble's got the ball teed up at the 35-yard line. And we are underway as we welcome you to Flexburg, Virginia. It's a squibber that's going to go out of bounds, and so Miami will be very happy to take it over. First and 10 at their own 35-yard line. The Hokies had lost 12 straight to Miami until two years ago. In 1995, down at the Orange Bowl, they here in Blacksburg, actually, in 95, they won it 13-7. to Last year, they won it 27, 21-7 to at Miami. The Virginia Tech defense, John Engelberger, he is going to be a very busy man tonight. Has three sacks on the season. Steve Tate, a walk-on story. He is magnificent. And Keon Carpenter returned a interception last year, 100 yards against Miami to clinch the win. And here's Edgerin James, first carry of the night. He's got about three yards on the play. He is met by the aforementioned Keon Carpenter. I'm impressed with James's leg strength. That looked like he should have had a loss of about two yards, but he plows through the defenders to pick up about three. James, a big kid, 6'1", 220. He's a sophomore. He and James Jackson, who's a freshman, have combined for 206, 266 of the 344 yards of offense last week. It is second down and six, and out of the eye formation, here's Edger and James. He's got himself a hole across the 40, brought down at the 42. He pointed out the fact that he's he's 220 plus pounds. Interesting, he's got a little shake in the hole. Take a look as he gets the ball and gets into the hole. This is a quality back that can still maintain his quickness and juke right here. Look at that off the right leg spins. Can't quite keep his feet. But an excellent job of running. So it is now third down and three yards to go. Have to get to the 45. Edger and James, as Todd mentioned right at the top of the show, is going to need a big game tonight to keep the Hurricanes in it. That's Fulcher in motion. James with a first down across the 45 and brought down at the 49-yard line by Jamel Smith. Everybody's talking about James, but certainly the offensive line for Miami has to step up here on the bigger, more physical Hokies. Cutting to the outside, gets a good block from the pulling guard that enables him to cut back to the inside. That was Carlos Calleas, who was able to come on front and lead James for a first down. It is James with three carries, 14 yards. So it's first down and 10 for the Hurricanes, up to the 49-yard line. James is the deep back in the eye formation. And this time, Clement's first pass of the night is complete. Out of bounds at the 40-yard line. And let's go now to Carl Ravich. All right, Charlie, thanks. Nebraska, Missouri. We showed you what happened to this point in a 31-28 game. Chris Brown, good from 44 yards away, tied at 31. Ten minutes left to go in this one. Missouri with the ball in their own 20, Charlie. All right, Carl, and here, Andre King with the reception, and it's second and less than one. I, I was pretty sure the baseball season was over, but that was a good-looking line drive right there for that field goal. <laughs> second and inches. James and he is going to lose a, maybe a half a yard on the play. Engelberger makes the tackle, the defensive end, number 96. One of the things that the young running back has to do is follow his fullback, even though he might not be where right here he needs to come here, but instead he bounces to the outside where he has no friends. And it's a great job of stuffing both the block and the run by Priolo, the rover. And there's a flag on the play. The officials are headed up by referee John Smith. Grabbing on the face mask. Defense, five yards, assess, the end of a run. My penalty first down. Well, that's not what the Hokies and Frank Beamer needed. Well, Priolo had the left hand on the mask, just pulled it a little bit, and at the end he pulled his hand off, but the official is on top of a good call. The Hokies have won 14 of their last 15 at home. Another flag. One of the things that happens is when people go in motion, the offensive line has to be cognizant of the fact that they can't adjust. Even though it's not moving by their standard, they can't Pitbull adjust in their stance. Ball That's ball the official saw. Good call. 
Butch Davis realizes his game is going, his team is going to need a mistake free. Take a look right here. Now, when a guy goes in motion, you can see the tight end moves forward and the guard rocks just a little bit. That's what the official saw. You can't move once, once the people are in motion. You have to be completely still. On first down and 15. Carlos Joseph is the up back. Edger and James, the deep back. Here's Clement with the pass to Reggie Wayne. Wayne's got it at the 36 yard line. I like the play calling here of Larry Coker. One of the things that they don't want to do is to get predictable and give Virginia Tech the chance to, to dump to dump eight in the box. Right here you can see here's the eighth man, but he's still playing a little bit of pass. Right here on the bottom now he comes out with a little short route, affording him the opportunity to say, hey, we've got a back pedal. We can't afford the luxury of just jamming people in just yet. Second down and 10 yards to go. James in the eye formation as the deep back. And here's Clement to throw. Gets rid of it in a hurry. And he completes it once again to Reggie Wayne. He fumbles the ball. It is out of bounds. So Miami will maintain possession. Well, Wayne does a great job coming back to the ball and then cutting up field. And this is a real break for the Hurricanes. Here you see the strip of the ball by Phillip Summers. The ball goes out of bounds right here. Big break for the Canes. Not only, of course, you can't fumble the ball forwards, but certainly there was nothing but Hokies around. Fortunate for Miami. And so while the ball went out of bounds inside the 10, the line of scrimmage will be the 16. A pickup of 20 on the play, first and 10. And the Hurricanes are moving with relative ease. As Daryl Jones in motion to the top of your screen, and Edron James finds himself a hole that is quickly sealed at the line of scrimmage by Steve Tate. Good opportunity here on second down to go for the play action. James cuts to the right, and there's just nobody there. The blitz blows the play up. Joseph can't get through the hole to lead, and Tate one of the four starting walk-ons for Virginia Tech on the defensive end. Their leading tackler makes the stick. Steve Tate is the leading tackler. 73 of them has three sacks on the season. Second and 10 at the 16. This is the eighth play of the opening drive. Here's Clement to throw. And he's got a completion to the five-yard line to the tight end, Daniel Franks. Well, Bubba Franks is a man that they feel as if that they've got a big mismatch. And what Virginia Tech decides to do is they want to come with the blitz and the tight end who's going to who's going to come across the field here has man for man coverage. Not going to chance to see that. That was a play before. But Franks is able to dominate because he's six foot six, 240 pounds. Franks outstanding tight end. And Clement has delivered the ball on the money thus far in this drive, Charlie. Clement, the senior, fifth all time passing quarterback. He is four for four and 44 yards. Here's Edron James. Can't Break the line of scrimmage once again. The ever-present Steve Tate along with Danny Wheel combining to make the tackle. But again, Charlie, not to be overly critical. If you see the thing is stuff, you are 220 pounds. Lower your shoulder and just don't just go in there. Don't hesitate and go east and west and give people a chance to stuff you for no gain. Second down and goal at the six-yard line. First series, if you're just joining us, it is chilly in Blacksburg, and this place is sold out. Daryl Jones in motion. Here's Clement running the other way. He's going to cut it back, and he is going to score. Touchdown, Ryan Clement, his first rushing touchdown of the year. Once again, Larry Coker right on top of it, going with the misdirection play action that they have not run up to this point. Everybody's going to move to the right of your screen. They want to get the ball to Franks, the tight end of the fire, but they have it covered. Now, Clement is not the fastest guy in the world, but he plays the angles. He cuts back to the middle where people have their backs turned in there and over other coverage. What a terrific series for Ryan Clement, who's been taking a lot of abuse this year, Charlie, but he was big time in that group. Andy Croslin for the extra point try. Straight down the middle. Miami on the board. 7 nothing. Now it's Virginia Tech's turn. ESPN 2's presentation of college football is brought to you by Honda. Vehicles designed to help simplify your life. So Miami got just what the doctor ordered and what Coach Butch Davis dearly wanted. 
Clement. Well, Ryan Clement was outstanding, and you can see here the quote that he had for the media this week. We don't get any awards or respect for the media. People watch college football until we get up to Blacksburg and get it done there. But this would be a huge upset for the Canes and a major, major stepping stone on the rebuilding process. And Butch Davis wanted to spend as much time on the field with his offense as he could. Number 37. And he certainly got that done neatly. Well, impressive. Four for four for 44 yards. And, of course, the running touchdown at the end. Clement was outstanding. That is Ike Charlton standing deep. He will be on your screen a lot. He returns kicks. He is a part-time wide receiver. He is also a part-time cornerback. The kick is high and short and fielded by an up back. Across the 20 to the 25 to the 30 and finally brought down at the 33-yard line. That was Andre Kendrick with the return. Now here's Carl Ravage. All right, Chaz, set the carrier dome. Donovan McNabb going to go up top looking for Kevin Johnson. 65 yards later, Kevin Johnson goes into the end zone. BC does have the ball, and they are marching in a 10-point game with 11-11 left to go. Well, that's not the news the Virginia Tech Hokies and their fans wanted to hear. They are in a must-win situation all the way down the stretch. Have a next week and then they finish at Virginia and then at home at Virginia. Now let's meet the offense for Virginia. Oxendine is the man. He has had four 100 yard rushing games so far this season. Ken Handy is a wide out. He's a junior who made his first career start last week. And Gennaro Dinopoli is a big time right tackle. He has started every game the past two years. Second down and ten. Clark, the quarterback who came into the game with a gimpy knee, picks up 13 yards on the play. The Miami defense is susceptible to the rush. And so Damian Lewis will be called upon. The freshman from Sulphur Springs, Texas, he leads the defensive line in tackles. Dan Morgan is a linebacker you want to keep your eye on. He's only 6'2 and 2'10, but he is very, very busy. And Jeff Popovich is starting a strong safety because the regular Dennis Scott is out for the season, tearing up a knee last week. First and 10, and this is Clark back to throw from the shotgun, firing over the middle. It is complete. Wide open was Brian Remley. A pickup of 23 yards on the play. Breakdown in the coverage for the Hurricanes. Nate Brooks, the cornerback, evidently thought that they were in a zone, and he lets he lets the receiver run free in the middle of the field. The protection for Clark is outstanding, and the result is that Remley is able to get a big gainer in the middle of the field. For Remley, only his second catch of the season. And out of the eye formation, the handoff is... Oh, no, it's going to be an option, and that is... Oxendine to about the 25-yard line. Well, evidently, they were trying to play a little possum with, with regards to Clark and his injury. They were talking about the fact that, hey, you know, the guy's gimpy. We don't know what the deal is. But instead, they've come right out and opted to go with the hurry up to confuse Miami and not afford them the opportunity to get the situational substitution. They really want to wear down the Canes, and they feel as if the no huddle will do that. Second down, three yards to go. Line of scrimmage is just outside the 25, and they've got to get to the 22 from the shotgun. Clark is going to run it. And Clark to the 20-yard line. He's got the first down. Chad Pegues made the tackle for the Hurricane. The advantage that Virginia Tech has in the offensive line is that they're outweighing Miami individually by close to 35 pounds per man. The result here is outstanding pass coverage. Really a pretty good, pretty good job by Miami getting Clark before he can get any more yardage. You can see his frustration there at the end of the run. The smallest guy on the Hokie offensive line is Derek Smith, merely 6'6 and 297. The center, Todd Washington, 6'3 and 317. And from the I formation, Oxendine gets the handoff and runs straight up the gut. Oxendine inside the 10 yard line and down to the seven. This is what Oxendine does well in between the tackles. The dominance you'll see of the offensive line. And look at how he breaks two arm tackles. You just can't get him with an arm. Right there, there's one. There's another one right through the middle. Oxendine is only about a 4.75 guy, but you can see right there the 30 pound advantage is taking its toll here on this particular drive. 
and so it is first and goal just outside the seven yard line Virginia Tech in their hurry up offense Oxendine the deep back in the I formation and here's Oxendine there's a flag on the play flag on the play whistle dead before the snap. Evidently a little bit of a twitch on the offensive line. Let's go now to Carl Ravage. Carl. All right, Charlie, number one, Nebraska in a heap of trouble in Columbia, Missouri. Corby Jones has been running effectively and passing effectively. Touchdown, Eddie Brooks. They're four for four in the red zone with four touchdowns against Nebraska. What a comeback story Missouri has been all year. Give Larry Smith a lot of credit. He's done an outstanding job with that program. So it is now first and goal for the Hokies back at the 12-yard line. Oxendine again in the I formation. Marcus Parker is the blocker in front of him. Al Clark, the quarterback, is going to call himself an automatic. And give it to Oxendine. And Oxendine inside the 10. Back down to about the 8-yard line. Second and goal. Great opportunity here for the Miami defense if they can somehow stop Virginia Tech. First and goal at the 13 is difficult, as we all know, in the red zone. If this young defense can somehow force the Hokies to kick a field goal, it would be a major, major moral victory. And again, Miami ranked 91st in rushing defense in the country. And Virginia Tech ranked 12th in rushing offense. And on the delay, here's Oxendine. Slips and falls and gets back to the line of scrimmage. Maybe third and goal. Excellent run support because you can't think that it's very much fun to come up to the secondary and take on that 228 pounder. But down he goes. Excellent job by Ridgeland making the tackle. So Michigan beats Penn State, and we welcome you to Lane Stadium in Blacksburg, Virginia. Charlie Steiner along with Todd Christensen and Chris Marla just underway. Miami scored on its first possession, leading 7 to nothing. And here are the Hokies. It is third down and goal at the 8-yard line. Quarterback Al Clark in the shotgun has time to throw. Now he doesn't. Now he's forced to run. Can he get outside? Yes, he can. He fumbles it out of bounds. It will be Virginia Tech ball, but it will also be fourth and goal. Awful lot of pressure put on this young Miami secondary, and they have come up big time in making the hit. Clark has all day to throw, but there's nobody open. Now he comes to his right, picks up a block right there from number 34. That could have been a clip. Look at the hit right there by number two, by number two, Nate Brooks. Separates him from the ball, and as we mentioned, forces a field goal. Miami's got to feel pretty good right now. Shane Graham's a pretty good field goal kicker, too. It's a 22-yarder, hash mark to the left. It's a difficult angle, but he nails it. So Virginia Tech answers with a field goal, trailing 7-3 in the first. Miami 7-3 over Virginia Tech, and Miami on its very first series. 11 plays, 65 yards. Reggie Wayne came up big and a little bit fortunate, too, as his fumble went out of bounds. And then a six-yard touchdown scamper by Ryan Clement gave the Hurricanes their 7-0 lead. The Hokies responded with a 22-yard field goal by Shane Graham, and that is where we are as Virginia Tech is kicking off. And that is Jimmy Kibble. Got it teed up at the 35-yard line. Moss and Popovich are standing deep. Santana Moss, and he can fly. Flag comes flying in on the play, two of them. Certainly going to be different field position this time for Miami. Last time, they only had to drive 65 yards because of the out-of-bounds kick. There, I really think that Moss had a chance to let it go, and it could have gone out of bounds. Excellent kick. Well, that's going up against Miami. ESPN 2's college football coverage continues next Saturday at half past noon in the East. But Tavian Banks and Tim Dwight lead the Hawkeyes into a battle with Northwestern. And then at five, the Owls take on the Utes in a whack showdown. And then Peyton Manning leads the balls into a meeting with the Razorbacks. Todd and Chris and I will be there for that one. 
And so with the penalty, Miami will take over first and ten back at their own nine-yard line. That is field position that Miami can ill afford. Pretty impressive graphic right there since 1983. Interesting to see as to whether or not those young Canes can make it stand up. Edger and James, a deep back in the eye formation. Carlo Joseph with the carry and Carl Ravage with a report. Bill Charlie, it is an unhappy valley. Michigan all over Penn State today. This touchdown to Charles Wilson covered 37 yards. They were up 10 0 after one, 24 0 at the half. Forget about it. 34 8 the final. Meantime, we'll keep you posted here. Missouri has the ball up a touchdown with three and a half to go. So much for judgment then. Well, the judge has gaveled it to order, and the order in the court at the moment is up in Wolverine country. Reggie Wayne, the intended receiver, second down and ten. Clement had what he wanted. You can see he was a little bit disgusted with himself. He had Wayne open on the slant, an awful lot of grass, but he just let him a little bit too much. Gretchen is third down now and seven yards to go. What is it Kenny Maine says? The games aren't played on paper, they're played. Oh, you don't know? Come on. Brian. Oh, are they <laughs> not? I don't know. I thought his line was they play him in TV sets. That's well, what. <laughs> you know. You're right. I, well, I tell you what, a lot of upsets. It's exciting. You never know. And meanwhile, Virginia Tech has got to be a little bit nervous with Syracuse beating up on Boston College. And the Hokies now trailing by four. Ryan Clement with a high fly ball down the right field line. And what it is catch. complete. What a catch. At the 37-yard line by Reggie Wayne. You know, Reggie Wayne was talking about wanting to break all of Michael Irvin's records, and I said, well, yeah, okay, so much braggadocio, but take a look at this, man-for-man -man coverage, and look at the throw by Clement. The defender actually is in pretty good coverage, but he has no chance. He drug both feet there. What a play by Wayne. 6'2", 190-pound freshman, and they think this kid is indeed star caliber, and you see why. Clemens got to like it. He's taking his lumps this year, but he sure, certainly looks sharp tonight. Wayne, three receptions, 62 yards. Edger and James in the backfield. Carlo Joseph is the up back in the eye formation, and here is Edger and James looking to circle right in. He does, and he picks up about seven yards on the play. Now, Charlie, that's what I was talking about once he got to the outside. Instead of trying to make an extra move and go wide, he breaks contain here, gets to the outside. Now he sees the corner come up. Now watch him square his shoulders and just run through the tackle. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, that's got to hurt. And Larry Coker, the offensive coordinator for Miami, pushing all the right buttons at this point, mixing up run and pass. Coker in his third year at Miami. And it is second down and two yards to go. Andrew and James breaks a tackle. And on the second effort, it looks like he's got enough for the first down. Way too early to make comparisons, but I'll tell you who he reminds me of both in physique and the way he runs. Dwayne Thomas. Dwayne Thomas is 6'1, 220, and he had that little bit of a shuffle. You know, he didn't fake, but he gave you that limp leg, and for some reason, tacklers kept falling off it. James reminds me a little bit of Dwayne. And Miami does pick up the first down on the play. Except he is a little bit more quotable. He will say more than evidently. Dwayne Thomas was usually unavailable for comment. So. The Sphinx. Mm -hmm. He can play, though. Oh, man, could he ever. We have a sideline warning. This is the sideline. First of the game. Butch Davis is saying, come on, man, we're excited. G give us a break. Okay, we'll back up. No big deal. Come on, let's get this going. Davis turns 46 a week from tomorrow. Hey, you know, Ch Charlie, I, I got to tell you, you know, you're know, you into the game. When you cross the thing, you get involved. It's not like you're trying to get an advantage, but rules are rules, I guess. Yeah, I think Miami still has a reputation to live down. Good point. From the eye, first and 10, Miami at the 49. Clem is going to throw it, and he's going to complete it out of the backfield. Carlo Joseph, and Joseph is inside the 30-yard line. Well, Carlo Joseph just goes in the flat, and nobody at Virginia Tech goes with him. What they need to do is if the linebacker opted to blitz, they rushed seven. Take a look right here. Either this backer or this backer has to have Joseph, who just goes in the flat. As a result, everybody rushes. The linebacker ends up taking the tailback, and there's nobody on Joseph who is wide open. A pickup of 24 yards on the play. You don't expect a six-foot, 226-pound blocking fullback 
to make big plays. Meanwhile, Clement is 6 of 7 for 95 yards here in the first quarter. And Edger and James looking to cut at the 25, still on his feet and down at the 24. He's frustrated because of the fact that he had a terrific stiff arm on Larry Green, but he couldn't keep his feet. And what happens, Charlie, is that when you need to cut in a direction, watch, he's going he's gonna to put him to the ground and then try and cut off his right leg, which, of course, you, it's just too difficult to do. Going to your right, you got to cut off the other leg, and he slides. He's a little frustrated. He thought he was going to get a bigger run. Pretty near a Heisman pose, wasn't it? Good looking back. I'm impressed with him. Second down, seven yards to go. Line of scrimmage to 24, and Miami has come out flying. Clement has time. Fires. And he nice completes catch. it inside the 15 yard line to the tight end. Bubba Franks, a pickup of 10. He, he caught it. He caught it. I'm sorry. I just get excited when I see a tight end. Can, watch the hands here. Watch. They're going to come back against the grain here on the in route. Take a look at the catch. Take a look at the hands. He extends himself on a cold night. Wow. 6'6", 240 pounds with Keon Carpenter hanging all over him. Coming into this game, Charlie, he had an average per catch of 17.2. And when we asked the head coach who was some of the young people he could build around, that's one of the names that he had. First down and 10. Edger and James trying to make something out of nothing. Finally is able to get out of bounds at the 17-yard line. And a loss of about a couple of yards. I don't know if there is such a school as the Walter Payton School of Stiff Arm, but James might have gone to it. And he is one of those youngsters you can see right there in the graphic. 20 of the top 44 players are very much underclassmen, and that's the rebuilding job that Butch Davis is doing right now, and he's doing it with optimism, and certainly at this point in the game, he's got nothing to be ashamed of. Necessity, of course, is the mother of invention with the uh, loss of some key players last year. Kennard Lang, Tuan Russell, Yatil Green, all expected to be back this year, but they sought their fame and fortune in the NFL. So they're gone. Second and 13. Here's Clement to throw over the middle. He's got the tight end, Bubba Franks. He's finally brought down at the five, close to the first down. The defensive strategy for teams coming into a game now is don't worry about it. We'll just put one guy on the tight end. You can't do it. There he is right here. He doesn't get up the ball quickly, but he fights through people, gets open. The corner, Lauren Johnson, is a little bit late, and that's just a big body with some athletic ability that you're going to have to deal with. They are less than a yard from a first down. The ball just resting on the five yard line. They have to get inside the five. If he runs the bootleg that he had before, he'll walk in for the touchdown. Instead, he's going to burst straight ahead and get the first down the hard way. Uh, I, I can dream. <laughs> so it will be first and goal for the Miami Hurricanes. And I tell you what, this crowd was juiced at kickoff, and now it is very quiet. They have taken the Hokie crowd out of it. Well, that man right there, Bubba Franks, is really turning turning this offense on. When you have a when you have a tight end that can do that, that alters your defensive strategy. No longer can you just say strong safety, you cover, or linebacker, you cover. They're going to have to start going with some double teams and some banjos, is what they make reference to with the linebacker and strong safety. Otherwise, he's going to kill them. Darrell Franks is flanked to the top of the screen. That's Fulcher in motion. Here's Edger and James for the touchdown. Hey, 12. A four-yard touchdown, and suddenly the Hurricanes, six-point underdogs, are ten-point leaders. Watch the limp leg. Watch the left leg that he gives right here. The limp leg. No, you're not going to get it. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. But he cuts through it, and he gets a great block in the end zone by his wide receiver, keeping the corner away from him. That was Daryl Jones in the end zone who enabled Green to slide in just inside the pylon. And Andy Crosland with the extra point. They can advance it. It is still loose. It was blocked by Carl Bradley, number 77. So it is 13 to 3. But Charlie, I was about to say, give Jeff Popovich the heads up for understanding that and sprinting after that and not giving Virginia Tech a gift two points. Yeah. 
Carl Bradley with the blocked extra point try, keeping Miami within 10. Now just a little momentum on the Kane train right here. He is going to bust through the gap and get his arms up. Shoot, he gets in so quickly. I think he actually might have blocked it with his, right there, you can see almost with his armpit. Now at the risk of insulting you people out there, it's a two-point conversion for Virginia Tech if they can pick the ball up. And that was heads up on the part of Larry Green, place kicking it downfield, giving the Hokies a chance. But once again, Popovich, Johnny on the spot, make sure they can't get the gift Carl Bradley, 6'2", and 273 from Lynchburg, Virginia, a sophomore. He blocked a field goal attempt against Arkansas State last week. And so now with the block extra point try, he has gotten his big mitts in the way. Virginia Tech is famous for blocking ki kicks, Charlie. Later on, we'll give you a graphic regarding the defense and special team touchdowns. The kick is high and short. And fielded again by Andre Kendrick. And Kendrick is across the 25 and brought down at the 28. NFL countdown every Sunday morning, 1130 Eastern Time. Join the distinguished faculty of Bristol University for the best pregame show in the NFL. And then at 7, it's all the highlights on primetime. Just throw him the damn ball. And then at 8, it's the bus to Pittsburgh. Jerome Bettis and the Steelers host the Ravens tomorrow night. A couple of buses in that one. You got Bam Morris on the other side, who's no slacker. First down and 10 for the Hokies. Oxendine, deep back in the I formation. Al Clark calling it automatic. Oxendine across the 30 to the 32, a pickup of three. Michael Smith, the linebacker, makes the tackle. Does show how strong Oxendine is, though. He carried Smith for an additional three yards. Time running out on the first quarter. Let's see if Al Clark gets this final play in or not from the shotgun. He will not. And so the Miami Hurricanes, they wanted to get off to the big start, and that's exactly what they did. Ryan Clement running one in from six yards away. And then Edron James ran one in. Wasn't supposed to happen this way as far as the Hokies were concerned. Down 10 early. Let's go downstairs to Chris Marlin. Charlie, this is the symbol of solidarity for the Virginia Tech offense. It's the link to a chain. At the start of the year, offensive coordinator Ricky Bussell gave one of these to every offensive player. You know the cliche, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. That's what they all carry. That's why this is a good offensive team. That's why they play together and stay together. And a moment at the moment, they're down by 10. Second down and seven. They've got the ball at their own 32-yard line. Oxendine. He's got a hole. Ken Oxendine nearly busted it. Brought down at the 40-yard line. Had it not been for Dan Morgan, he may have been gone. Pulling out and giving him an opportunity to get misdirection. Counter Trey. Here come the pulling guard and tackle. And they block out. Cuts inside, and you're right. Morgan right here just trips him up because there's only two Miami defenders left. Miami having the ball almost. Well, more than four minutes. More than Virginia Tech did in the first quarter. So they got the time of possession. They got the yardage. And they got the scores. That's exactly what they wanted and desperately needed. Well, the strange thing if you're Virginia Tech's offense is you say, wait a minute, what's the problem? We drove the length of the field. We did a great job, kicked the field goal. And what do you mean we're down 10? So Bud Foster, the defensive coordinator for Virginia Tech, right now has to be making some adjustments on the sidelines because Miami seems to be doing everything right up to this point. And Nebraska has tied it with no time left, and they've gone into overtime. How about Mizzou? But with the ease with which Michigan beat Penn State today, regardless of the outcome of the game, I would think Michigan's going to be number one tomorrow. Well, you're a Big Ten guy. Last week when it was Penn State, you said, oh, no, they've got to stay number one. Well, Penn State got beat. They're done. And that is Oxendine across the 45 to about the 47. Pick up of about seven on the play. Cliff Jackson, a reserve linebacker, made the tackle. One of the things that Bill Miller, the defensive coordinator for Miami, has to think about here is that even though he does not have the depth, 
he might have to start substituting some people sometime in the middle of the second quarter because this does fatigue a defense when you do not have the luxury of huddling. Eight carries, 42 yards for Oxendon. And this looks like a busted play. Clark is lucky to get back to the line of scrimmage, and he is met by a half a dozen white jersey hurricanes. Marcus Parker evidently went the wrong direction because, because Clark was giving it the fake, and there was nobody there. You can see right there, he cuts up, does the smart thing, doesn't try and make something out of nothing, but gets up and gets a yard. And Bill Miller, defensive coordinator for Miami, a little bit concerned, but has to be happy with the fact that his canes have been scrapped. It is third down and three. They have to get past the 49, and they will. Here's Clark. He's got a hole, and he's going to go. And he laterals to Oxendine. Oxendine inside the 10. Well, that woke up the slumbering crowd, didn't it? A pickup of 46. Clark is hurting. You can see in the open field. Charlie, I guarantee that right here, look at the blocking at the point of attack. Right here, he goes. He's gone the distance normally, but he's dragging a little bit, and the result is that Nate Brooks is there. So he does the heads-up thing and pitches to Oxendine, and give Oxendine credit. A lot of times, the trail back will not follow the quarterback throughout the play, but the result of that being heads-up on the part of both Oxendine and Clark as they get big yards now inside the 10, first and goal. And for the first time since the opening kickoff, the crowd is back into it. First and goal. And now Carl, wait a minute, on second effort, that's going to be a touchdown. Well, Marcus, Marcus Parker. Marcus Parker took advantage of the fact that Virginia Tech up to this point had been so effective in the option. Instead of faking, they give the ball to Parker. Everybody's playing wide. Parker only has to break one touchdown. He's able to plow it in because of the lack of case. Take a look right here. He plows in. Everybody's playing outside. You can see right here the linebacker's full. Parker breaks a tackle and is able to just bust it into the end zone. 5'10, 227 pounds. He's a load. And now the extra point for Shane Brand. Go back to Carl Ravage, Carl. Hi, Charlie. Let's show you how Nebraska forced overtime in a wild play. Scott Frost, as time would run out, throws to the end zone. Watch Shevin Wiggins kick it up in the air. And Matt Davison takes it off the turf. 38 all. Nebraska has the ball first in overtime. We'll keep you posted. Looks like the immaculate reception. Now, I was just thinking the same thing. Isn't that interesting? Larry Smith. Now, there was a coach who's been around the block. You know, instead of spiking the headset or something like that, here's the guy that knows. He just smiled and said, hey, that's the serendipity of the college game. And so it is Marcus Parker with his fourth touchdown of the season and a tremendous second effort that got him into the end zone. That has given Virginia Tech new life. And they are back within three of the Hurricanes at 13 to 10 with 12 minutes and 58 seconds to go in the first half. Well, Charlie, as we mentioned, it's not just a one-dimensional running attack for Virginia Tech. Parker and Pegues can also make major contributions in the rushing game. And the fact that Parker has played some tailback certainly bodes well when they give him the ball in the up-back position because he can shake and bake and run over some people as we just saw. Parker was complaining last week he had only carried 37 times all year. And last week alone he carried 10 for 40 yards. And on his first carry of the night tonight, the touchdown. four-yard line. ESPN's college football coverage continues Thursday at 7.30 Eastern Time with a weekend kickoff show sponsored by Coors Light. After that, the Bearcats beat the Pirates in a Conference USA showdown. ESPN, 8 o'clock Eastern this Thursday night. Rick Minner's got a good thing going there in Cincinnati earlier in the season, Charlie. We're up there in Boston College and we televised that big upset that they had there. And Rex Ryan, the defensive coordinator, has him going after some people. You know, in retrospect, maybe it wasn't such an upset. Good point. It was then, but not now. First and ten, Miami at the 24-yard line. James Jackson is now the deep back in the I formation. And flags fly at the line of scrimmage before the snap and probably procedure against Miami. Not only difficult communication, but they went with a three-wide receiver set, something they have not used much of here up to this point. 
may have caused some confusion. Ball start, office, five yard penalty, still first down. So it'll be first and 15. James Jackson, a freshman, is the deep back in the I formation. Three wides. And here's Jackson's first carry of the night. Jackson's got some room. Jackson has one man to beat, and he's not going to beat him, but he's going to get a first down across the 35. Only Ike Charlton remain between Jackson and the touchdown. A pickup of 17. But he always talks about a change of pace. James Jackson is a burner. He is not the big body that James is. Take a look. Good blocking at the point of the of attack. Watch the cuts here. Cutting across the drain, breaking an arm tackle, cuts to the outside. Now maybe he would have been better off if he just kept his momentum going to the outside, certainly for extra yardage. But give Charlton credit for the open field tackle. Save the touchdown. And here's Jackson again, and he is down and for a loss. Bird comes from the backside, and that took way too long to develop. Misdirection play. Take, it just takes too long. Look at the extra step, and now instead of cutting to the outside, he steps up, trying to fool the backside in, but Bird was not fooled. Showed great speed getting in the backfield. Corey Bird, who came to Virginia Tech as a wide receiver, now they're starting outside linebacker. And he can get in in a hurry. A couple of tackles for a loss, a couple of sacks. Second down. 14, loss of four on the play and a flag fly. Wow. Dead ball, ball start. Gets the offense. I've got penalty. Remains second down. It's a hurricane's becoming unhinged. I believe it was Robert Sampson. It appeared that he just, for whatever reason, thought that they were going on the quick count. He was the only one to back up, and he backed up about three yards. We're up three, says Butch Davis. Relax. Let's get control of this thing again. Second down, 19 yards to go. And here's Clement to throw. Fires near side. Incomplete. Intended for Daryl Jones. That would he want a good protection at the deep comeback route to Jones, but just threw it a little bit high. That is Corey Bird's father. Just learned that Nebraska has won the game. And they have beaten Missouri in overtime 45-38, tying it on the last play in regulation, and then winning it in OT. They're number one. They're number one. Have to talk to some Michigan fans about that. And here's Clement running for his life, throwing off his back foot downtown. Did he get it? Yes, he did. Santana Moss inside the 35-yard line. What a throw by Ryan Clement. Whatever Clement had for breakfast, that's what I want. Whatever his vitamins are, that's, the, that's what I want. Running to his left and making this throw and putting it right on the chest of Moss. Boy, that is just a terrific athletic play. Give Moss credit for coming up and getting the ball, but Clement is the one that makes that play with what a lot of people felt was suspect mobility, but at this point, I'm not so sure. He looks pretty good moving around to me, Charlie. Pick up a 42 yards on the play. It is first and 10 at the 32. Here's James Jackson. And he gets maybe three on the play. Once again, brought down from the backside. In this case, their speedster Corey Moore, their leading sacker. It appears that it appears that Jackson, when he doesn't have the same time and repetitions as Green does, that the plays develop a little bit slower because he's certainly fast enough. Corey Moore, the defensive end, supposedly at six foot 220 pounds, is reported as a 45640. Brownsville, Tennessee. He's got four sacks on the season. He's big and he's fast. Second down, eight to go. Out of the eye. Gave it to the up back, Nick Williams. And he is brought 
down, maybe a pickup of two on the play. Tate was the man there, the leading tackler who stuffed it. The idea there was with a three wide receiver set, they wanted to fool them and get to the outside, thinking they wouldn't give the ball to the fullback. But give Tate a lot of credit. Former walk on kicker, if you can believe that, made himself into a linebacker, and now he's outstanding. Charlie, a potential Big East pick. Third down, and about five to go. Trouble. Rolling, flag on the play, throwing, and it's incomplete at the 16 yard line. Jackson, the intended receiver, but a flag on the play and probably a holding against Miami. Because it's at the point of an attack, it appeared that it was about three or four yards behind the line of scrimmage. So I'm thinking here that Virginia Tech is not going to refuse it, but instead take it and take their chances with Clement one more time. Jimmy Smith, the referee, talking with free safety and team captain Keon Carpenter. Holding, gets the offense, 10 yards, assess, spotted a foul, remains third down. Virginia Tech, you can see right here is the holding call. He's going to roll to his right, and number 79, Curlin Blaze, just cannot get it done without grabbing a hold of Corey Moore, the speedster that we already mentioned. And so now, Virginia Tech, good decision here to move him back. Third down and 23. And this is not the news the Hokies needed to hear. Syracuse holds on, beats Boston College 20 to 13. Virginia Tech, if they want to go to an Alliance Bowl, can ill afford to lose tonight. Virginia Tech did not have the people on the field that they wanted, and so Bud Foster came off the sideline to screen timeout. We're going to take a break. 13-10, Miami with the lead. 9.32 to go, first half. ESPN 2's presentation of college football is brought to you by Mazda. Come see what happens when a car company has more engineers and fewer accountants. And by Keystone Light, America's never bitter beer. Miami tonight, four of four on third down conversions, but nothing like this one. Third down and 23 yards to go. Line of scrimmage is the 45, and they have to get down to the 22. They lead it by three as Ryan Clement leads his club to the line of scrimmage. Reggie Wayne is like way to the top of the screen, man for man coverage. The intended receiver in the pass is overthrown at the 15-yard line. Excellent protection and a good route by Wayne on the corner route, but Clement just overthrew him. He threw it before he got out of his break, and as a result, Wayne was not able to find it in the air, even though he was open. And so on fourth down, Andy Croslin will punt it away. Croslin is both the punter and the place kicker for Miami. And Larry Green stands back to get his own 10. Green's going to let it bounce, and it's going to bounce dead at the one. Wow. That was Jeffrey Taylor who saved it, but there's a flag on the play. Flag on the play. Flag on the play. Oh, the That's Hokies huge. breathing a sigh of relief. Butch Davis didn't need to hear that news. Really didn't, because not just the great kick, but now, more than likely, it's not going to be a situation where the returner's just going to let it go. This could turn in, Charlie, to like a 20 or 25-yard chain. Against the kicking team, 10 yards assessed, out of the foul, still fourth down. You look for little turning points as a game wears on. And with a team of... Miami with a lack of confidence coming in. Take a look right here. This appeared to be where the holding was. Cutting to the outside. The fullback sets up. Has him by the right arm. And give credit. You know what though, Charlie? Give credit to the defender who came in there who did a little bit of an act falling down to force the call by the official on the side. And the snow is beginning to fall here. Six penalties, 59 yards for Miami. It is now fourth and 38. Croslin with a short punt. Fair 
catch at the 27-yard line by Larry Green. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. And you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. First and ten for Virginia Tech. They're trailing by three. They've got the ball. First and ten at their own 27-yard line. And that holding penalty against Miami on the punt that would have had the Hokies back at their own one killed them. So instead of being at their own one, the Hokies now first and ten at their own 27-yard line with Oxendine and Parker lined up behind quarterback Al Clark. Clark came into the game with a gimpy knee. He did not play last week. And here he is rolling and throwing. And Completing it to Marcus Parker. Parker cuts it to 40 and finally is brought down at the 47 yard line. Again, we mentioned the fact that as a former tailback, once he gets out into the open field, he can be difficult. And certainly Jeff Popovich found that out. Take a look here it is. He's in the flat by himself. Popovich comes over to make the play and look at Parker just lose him right there. Gives a little shake and bake to get some extra yardage. But what a weapon to have somebody that can catch and run like that at the fullback position. A pickup of 19 yards for Marcus Parker. And it's first and 10 now at the 47 yard line. Parker and Oxendine line up in the I formation. Pitch out, and that's not exactly where Clark expected Oxendine. And so, as a result, a loss of about seven on the play. Damian Lewis made the tackle. Charlie, I think that's Clark that made the mistake there. Both backs and the guards pulling were going to the right. One of the reasons that uh, Virginia has gone almost exclusively to the run this year is the injury to their wide receiver Sean Scales. He was not only their, their best wideout. Now here's the handoff. Oh, it's a little pitch out. The option to Oxendine and he's brought down at the 44 yard line. The injury to Sean Scales. He was their lead kickoff return and punt returner, wide receiver, and he is out for the season. And so that has forced Virginia Tech to go to a much more conservative running game. And you have a look at Sean Scales, and we'll be hearing from him in just a moment. It is third down and 14 yards to go. With Clark in the shotgun. Handy and Gildersleeve. Wide receivers. Clark has a lot of time, a lot of time firing, and he completes it to the tight end. Sean Sullivan, he's going to be three yards shy of the first down. A pickup of 11, he needed 14. Collision in the middle of the field, and Sullivan certainly won that one. Man for man coverage. He busts the strong safety that has him in coverage. But Frank Beamer understands that there's a long way to go, and they're only down by three. They want to play the field position game, and this is wisdom. And that brings on Jimmy Kibble to punt it away. Kibble standing at his own 42 with Wayne Starks standing back at his 10. Starks has returned 185 yards for a touchdown this year. The left footed punter plants it deep to deep into the end zone. Miami takes over first and 10 at their own 20 with 630 to go in the first half. Welcome back to Blacksburg. When he's healthy, he's one of the best wide receivers in the Big East. Sean Scales out for four games with a dislocated tendon. This is the kind of game you'd like to be playing in right now, wouldn't you? This is what it's about. You know, you have a full house, and playing hard. That's what it's all about right here. What is your timetable for return? Can you get back this season? Um, the doctor said it was possible because when they did the surgery, there wasn't as much damage as they thought it was. So it's very possible. How much could you be helping your team right now? What impact would you have on the Hokies? Well, I think I, I definitely, in, in the past, I've been able to get downfield, and I definitely think we're missing that right now, and that's where I know I would help the team. All right, Sean Scales, hope you come back very, very soon. Thanks for the visit. Thank you. Back to Charlie. First and 10, Miami at their own 20. They've got a three-point lead. And Clements' pass is complete to Nick Williams. He's run out of bounds at about the 23 by Steve Tate, second and seven. I know that when we visited with the coaches, Charlie, uh, Coach Beamer in particular made a point to say that we are really missing Sean Scales and we have to alter our passing game as a result. They have become a much more conservative lot with the absence of Scales. And so now, second down and seven at the 23. Edger and 
James for a couple to the 25. He's met by a half dozen Virginia Tech Hokies. Nate Williams, chief among them. Another situation where third and five, they need another crucial third down. As you mentioned, they were perfect with the exception of the third and 106 or whatever it was recently. So Might as well have been. We just need to see here what offensive coordinator Larry Coker has up his sleeve. Third and five. Two flankers way out to the top. Wayne and Jones. And Clements going to call himself an audible. Still has some time to get the snap. Had a lot of time. A lot of time firing. Ball's tipped in the air. Incomplete. So it will be fourth down and five. Nick Williams, the fullback, was running free. You're going to see plenty of time. Here he comes right there. He's blocking. Now watch what happens. He cuts back to the left to help out his quarterback. Wide, wide open. He would have gotten the first down easily, but it was batted down by Nate Williams, which forces the Canes to punt. Andy Croslin punting it away. Larry Green at his own 25-yard line. He's going to return it. Has nowhere to run. Down at the 36. Virginia Tech within three, 4.54 to go, first half. With 4.54 to go in the first half, Virginia Tech trailing by three. They've got the ball, first and 10 at their own 36. They have two timeouts left in the first half. Miami has his full complement of three. Ike Carlton, rather Ike Charlton, the defensive back is now the wide receiver at the top of the screen, but the handoff is to Oxendine. Oxendine is maybe a two-yard gain as Eugene Ridgely made the tackle from his free safety spot. One of the people that I'm surprised we haven't seen at this point, Charlie, and maybe a lot of it has to do with the no huddle, is Lamont Pegues. The transfer from Clemson has been outstanding up to this point, but right now they've opted to go with Oxendine the whole way. Pegues rushed for 100 yards last week. Charlton and Handy flank to the top of the screen. Stewie is the flanker down at the bottom. Option to Oxendine, and he is going to lose yardage. Third down now and about 13 or 14 yards. And where is Lamont McGee? There he is. Jeff Taylor, along with number Well, Jeff Taylor from the middle inside does a great job of smelling this out. Look at the pursuit to the outside here. Oxendine just doesn't have the speed to get around him, and as a result, Taylor drops him for a loss. This is one of the reasons, Charlie, why I mentioned Pegues, because obviously he's a much faster back than Oxendine, and they could give them a little bit of a change up here at this point. Third down and 10 from the shotgun. Correction. That is third and 10. And there is Clark. Pickup of about six, but he's well short of the first down, and the ever present Dan Morgan, the outside linebacker, makes the tackle. And Virginia Tech's going to have to punt it away. One of the things that happened here is that even though Miami isn't as strong up front, they do have some speed at the linebacker core. And a quick kick. That is going toward the corner and bounced out of bounds at the 20 yard line. Virginia Tech booted that one off in a hurry. Frank Beamer with some tricks up his sleeve. Well, you, well, you saw that Butch Davis was trying to get his people off the field. Coach Beamer trying to see if he can get a cheap five yards. Good job of having his team prepared, but the Canes were able to get off the sidelines. Obviously, the first two series were outstanding. Take a look at that 92 yard drive, but since that point, Bud Foster has made the requisite adjustments, and the Hokies have stiffened. First down and 10 at the 20. Here's Edger and James. James gets outside briefly and is brought down at the 26. Steve Tate made the tackle. It will be second down and five. Hard to believe when you watch that young man that he was a walk-on. I mean, he just wants to hit somebody. It's clear. He has that inside linebacker mentality, and I thought it interesting in reading some of the notes that they saw that early on when he was a walk-on place kicker. They'd never seen a place kicker that wanted to hit people as much as this guy. And here's a guy who's paid his dues. In 94, didn't play. In 95, he played exclusively on special teams. 96 got a scholarship. This year, he's their leading tackler. Second and four. And a 
first down across the 30 to about the 34-yard line. Edrin James with the pickup. Again, between the tackles, James does a great job of squaring his shoulders and running people over, not trying to get the big run, but instead get the first down. A pickup of eight for Edrin James here in the first half. 13 carries, 44 yards. First and ten. The line of scrimmage just inside the 40-yard line of Miami. Here's James trying to make something out of nothing, and he is unable to do so. Bradley, Carl Bradley made the tackle. He was the one who blocked the extra point try earlier in the ballgame. Wheel was a part of that, too, stuffing the blocker. And right now would be a good opportunity for Miami to go with some play action pass and shake things up. Even though they want the clock to run, they have decent enough field position to take advantage of the fact that Virginia Tech is plowing seven and eight into the box. Clock continues to run on the first half in Miami with the three-point lead and the possession in no great hurry. It's going to be delay a game. I don't think he got I don't think he got it. No, he didn't. And so referee Jimmy Smith. Unless the official. Dead ball. Delay of game. Offense. Five-yard penalty. Still second down. Once again, here's a situation, Charlie, where you've got a young team up by three in a hostile environment. And what happens sometimes is that you're so surprised that you're up and you say to yourself, okay, well, then let's play not to lose. And there, clearly, there was a situation where they're coming up, they're uncertain. But the advantage here, of course, is that the clock continues to run. And I think the Virginia Tech will be wise after this play to take a timeout. Seven penalties, 63 yards for Miami. On second down, 16 yards to go. Here's Clement drawing off his back foot again incomplete. Intended for Reggie Wayne who tried to make the shoot top catch. Good. Wayne needed to come back to the ball a little bit more on that. Granted the throw was a little bit short. But that's what you teach the receivers to do is come back to the ball. And Wayne was trying to catch it off his shoot tops instead of lunging forward, maybe getting it between the numbers. Reggie Wayne, one of 25 freshmen who have played for Butch Davis this year. 15 true freshmen. Seven true freshmen have started for this rebuilding Miami team with three timeouts left. Edrin James picks up just a few. It will be fourth down. Virginia Tech does call its timeout here. They now will have one timeout left and 52 seconds when they get the ball back following the Andy Crosland punt. So we're going to take a timeout and see what Virginia Tech does with its final possession of the first half. So once Andy Crosland punts it away, and presumably Larry Green returns it and maintains possession, Virginia Tech will have 40-something seconds left. the fair catch at the 29 yard line and coming up on the national car rental halftime report with Carl Ravitch judgment day now with Nebraska winning in overtime and Michigan winning big who's number one and highlights of Syracuse and BC and that game looms large here in Blacksburg Virginia tonight you know in your scenario about jumping two people let's not forget you know Florida State would have went big tonight mm -hmm. you know, in North Carolina or really win it all I mean what a tough place you beat the number five team at their place. That's going to be a whale of a ball game we'll keep you up to date on that and here's a little pitch out to Oxendine he can't turn the corner he is able to get out of bounds and Dwayne Starks pushed him out it'll be second down and oh maybe about seven or eight to go. I wonder here at this point is the offensive cognoscenti of Virginia Tech has decided that they want to run this out. That was a strange call there. That would be the chief cognoscentor. Second and seven at the 32. Firing sideline complete. 
clock will continue. No, they stopped the clock at the 40-yard line. Michael Stewie with his first catch of the night. I can't tell, though, Charlie, as to whether or not they stopped it with the first down or if he did get out of bounds. It looked to me like he was tackled inbounds, which he was. Clock continues to run. Here's Clark firing, completing to Marcus Parker, but he can't get out of bounds. There's a flag on the play, and there's an injured Miami player at the 32-yard line, holding against Virginia Tech. And the injured player is Chad Pegues. Well, one of the one of the problems that the Canes have had is injuries to the key defensive players and Pegues is certainly one of those people number 94 an outstanding pass rusher and good run support man one of the few if you can call a junior and upperclassman that they have playing regularly but you know we talked about it coming in the game about the difficulty that Miami has had 10 yards assess the spot of the foul remains in first stopping seven. the run and they've done a fine job of it, actually containing Virginia Tech here in the first half. Hokies trailing by three. Take a look at Pegues here. He gets a little bit of a double team. Now he goes for the pursuit. And I do believe that that's, that's the penalty right there. It certainly was. The penalty was called on number 67, Brad Baylor. And it looked like it might have been a little bit of a wet leg whip. But judging by the way Pegues is walking, I think he should be okay for the second half. So it's merely first down and 30 yards to go for the Hokies. And the clock is running with, well, you see, about 10 seconds left. They're going to run it. And Oxendine is going to get tackled at the 25 by Dan Morgan. And that is where the first half has come to an end. And we welcome you back to Blacksburg, Virginia. And the Hokies are trailing by three as we get the third quarter underway. First half statistics. Miami wanted the time of possession, and they got it, and they made the most of it. The thing that surprises me there, though, is the passing yards. I hadn't anticipated that they would be as successful as they have, but give Clement credit. He's been the man. Here we begin the second half with Mike Charlton. Charlton still on his feet, and he is down at the 33-yard line. Charlie Steiner back with Todd Christensen, and a real surprise in that Miami has been able to control the ball and, and for the most part, contain the running game of Virginia Tech. I think it's going to be interesting, this young team, as to whether or not they know what they're doing. Here at halftime, they're up by three, saying to themselves, are you kidding me? Where we are, can they maintain the intensity of the second half? That's the big question. So many questions coming into this game, including the temperature. Could the guys from South Florida handle the temperatures that are now in the 30s? They don't feel a thing. Ken Oxendine is across the 35, about to the 39-yard line, and here's Chris Marlowe. All right, talked to both coaches at halftime. Butch Davis said he was happy with a good start. He was disappointed with the penalties. His key in the second half stopped the option. Meanwhile, Frank Beamer said Miami played well. Uh, the defense kind of uh, adjusted after a while, and we've got to stop the long pass plays. That was his key in the second half. Charlie? On second and three out of the I formation. Oxendine has the first down to the 45-yard line. This makes sense here, and here's why. Virginia Tech, we, we noted the graphic early on in terms of the dominance that they had on the offensive line and the 30 pounds more per man. This is what they have to do. They got away from this a little bit, trying to get Oxendine outside with some sweeps and counters. He just doesn't have that kind of foot speed. Going between the tackles is his forte. 17 carries and 103 yards for the senior from Chester, Virginia. He and Marcus Parker in the I formation behind Al Clark. And Oxendine gets maybe two on the play, but coming into the game, Virginia Tech felt that they could wear down Miami with their superior size and strength on the line. 
Well, Dan Morgan able to stuff him there for a two yard gain. Part of the problem here though Charlie with the no huddle is that sometimes you cannot communicate play action. That's a difficult thing to communicate because of the different numbering and lettering and certainly on situations like this second and eight good opportunities for that very play. And from the shot. Mark fires over the middle and he's got Marcus Parker at the 45 yard line. It will depend on where they mark the ball. It looks like he's going to be shy of a first down by less than one. Marcus Parker has been a mismatch for any linebacker on Miami's squad to be able to cover him. He's done a great job making the catches and making people miss. Little circle route to the left of your screen. He's going to come in all day to throw. Clark delivers the ball on the numbers. Just a little bit short of the first down with the big bodies that Virginia Tech has. Should be academic. Five catches, 71 yards for Parker, who is now the blocking back for Oxendine. And Oxendine's got the first down to the 44. Showing the versatility of Parker, he goes from being a pass catcher that has to come up and be the Iron Man, nail the linebacker in the hole that enabled Oxendine to get the first down. Good football player, number 34. He's shown all the skills that a running back can possibly have. The ability to run and catch, and block, First and ten at the 44-yard line. Virginia Tech has not led in this game. Two wides to the left. Gildersleeve and Handy. And the handoff straight up the gut. Marcus Parker picks up about nine on the play. This, this is a play that's going to be effective for a number of reasons, but the one in particular is what Coach Butch Davis said to Chris Marlowe in his interview, and that was, we need to stop the option. Well, if you're going to be that cognizant of the outside, then it's going to be an advantage for Parker to get between the tackles and be able to make some people miss who are normally there, but instead in pursuit of the option. Second down and one. They've got to get to the 34. Some yardage Parker does on that. Bad decision on the part of Clark. There's a situation where he certainly needed to pull the ball out and run the option. Defense just stuffs Parker in the hole right there. Clark needs to pull it out and go down the line, but instead he makes Parker eat it, and thus a loss. So it is third and a very long one. The line of scrimmage is the 36. Oxendine's got the hole and the first down to the 30-yard line. He saw that hole, and there was the biggest burst he's shown all night. Not that I want to give too much credit to Bum Phillips, but he's the one famous with, you dance with who brung you. Well, what brung a Virginia Tech to this point is their physicality and ability to run through the tackles. And once again, in a crucial third down play, they give it to Oxendine with the lead blocker and get it with yardage to spare. And there appears to be an injury on the field. Number 74 is Derek Smith, 66297. He's gonna get he's gonna get rolled up in the back of his legs. This is the hazard of offensive linemen constantly, as you see. No intention of hurting him, but Dan Morgan spins his legs around and catches number 74, Derek Smith, in the back of the legs, and hence the reason why. He's a little bit gimpy. Bad news is Smith is sidelined for the moment. The good news is Dan Morgan's only 6 2 and 210. Smith is 297. Tech on this play, on this drive, eight plays, and all of them have been on the ground. First and 10. And here's the pass. Throwing long toward the end zone. Charlton cannot hang on. Wayne Starks, man for man in the end zone. And give Starks credit because he did something that, that sometimes cornerbacks give up on. Right at the end of the play, watch. There, he might make the catch now. What does he do? He gets just a piece of his right arm so he cannot bring the ball in. Starks clearly has beat. The ball is thrown just a little bit too far. But right there as he touches the right arm, Charlton cannot come up with the ball. That's Clark's first interception or incompletion of the night. That play was set up after all that running. Nobody in center field. Great call. Second down and ten. Mark 
Marcus Parker straight up the gut to about the 26, a pickup of about three on the play. I can't help but think, Charlie, with all the running that's been going on, and I don't know if it's necessarily in Virginia Tech's arsenal. I guess it is because everybody has it. The halfback pass at this point would just be absolutely monstrous. The run support would come flying up. They'd have a gimme touchdown. Miami coming into the game. Take a look at Frank Beamer. Butch Davis's club ranked 91st in stopping the run. And here is Virginia Tech on third down and seven. Clark's second pass of the half. That's completed to Oxendine. And he's got enough for the first down inside the 20. They'll mark it at the 18. Coach Jeffrey is, Taylor made the tackle. Coaches love a runner like Oxendine. He may not be blazing fast and have a lot of moves, but he is going north and south. Here he's going to come and he's going to run a sit route where he comes down and just sits down beyond first down yardage, gets the ball, powers forward. Even though the two white shirts are there, he gets enough for the first. And this is the kind of long drive the Hokies had envisioned throughout the game. This is their first real bone jarring. Drive. Derek Smith is back in the lineup now for yeah. Virginia Tech. Now the question at this point, Charlie, is it the offensive line dominating or is it a situation where Miami's getting tired? You would think that coming out of the second half, that would not be an issue. But what happens is when you continue to make the third down conversions, it really puts some mental pressure on the defense. You keep saying, nuts, we can't get it done, we can't get it done. It starts to affect you psychologically. They give away about 30 pounds per man, the Miami defense does, to the offensive line of Virginia Tech. Inside the 15 to the 14. I read an article coming into this game, Charlie, about how Ken Oxendine was taking the bulk of the load. Well, <laughs> I don't even think bulk is the right word. I mean, this is the guy they've gone to constantly. And once again, I'm very surprised. Pagese's legs have to be ultra fresh. He's somebody that, as I mentioned before, could give him something, a bit of a shakeup. But thus far, Coach Beamer hasn't opted to do that. In his first three years, Ken Oxendine has averaged six yards per carry at Virginia Tech. He had Jim Druckenmiller as his quarterback, and that certainly opened up some options for him. Straight up the gut. Hawkins, touchdown. Cullen Hawkins just reported in. First carry of the night. Touchdown, Virginia Tech. Great job because what happened is that Oxendine from the back formation actually runs in front and he is the lead blocker and he takes some defenders with him. Take a look right here. He's going to come in and be the lead blocker. Everybody thinks he's going to get the ball. Instead, he even bumps into his man, gets a great block, knocks off two canes. And boy, how's that for your first carry of the game for Cullen Hawkins? Six points. First touchdown of the year. And for the first time tonight, the Hokies have the lead. And Shane Graham has the extra point. Good. Well, the Hokies strike first blood in the second half and take the lead for the first time tonight. 22 carries, 117 yards for Ken Oxendine, and the touchdown run of 14 yards by Cullen Hawkins, capping off the 68-yard drive in six minutes and 43 seconds. I find it I find it interesting Charlie that if you that, that was a microcosm of a guy who's carried a lot has done this before the camera's on him he doesn't turn around the other kid was first touchdown turns around hey hey cool he hasn't been there and he hasn't done it Oxendine has and that's going to be a touchback and Miami will take over first and ten at their own 20. The ESPN's college football coverage continues Thursday at 730 right after Sports Center with the weekend kickoff show sponsored by Coors Light. After that, the Bearcats and the Pirates in a Conference USA showdown. That's this Thursday, 7.30 Eastern, and then the game at 8. And now here are the Hurricanes having to play from behind for the first time tonight. Let's see how they respond. It, it will be interesting, Charlie, to see how you could be served. A lot of adversity right now. Crowd's back in it. 
And 10 at the 20. Edger and James turns the corner, and he's run out of bounds and picks up about nine on the play. Lauren Johnson, the left corner, made the tackle. And Reggie Wayne, the wide receiver, does a tremendous job of blocking. So many times wide receivers are not into the blocking thing, but as he breaks outside, you're going to see number 87 right on top of his person. The corner never comes up until he's 11 yards downfield. Great job by number 87 blocking downfield. This kid Reggie Wayne can do just about everything. He can run, he can catch, has great hands, and show that he can block as well. Second and one. James cuts and gets the first down across the 30 to the 33 yard line. Jamel Smith was in on the play. Steve Tate was in the neighborhood as well. James has done a good job here, Charlie, of taking the crowd out of this. On your own 20 yard line, 53 plus thousand screaming. Suddenly the first down makes a big difference. Now you're not as nervous. And Miami can go to an, has an opportunity here, maybe to throw on first down and shake things up. Miami lost four of their first five games. They have bounced back neatly with a 45-44 double overtime win at BC. Beat up on Temple and Arkansas State. It is a rebuilding process in Miami on many levels. Edger and James maybe gains a yard. Danny Wheel and Jamel Smith combined to tackle them. Somebody we haven't talked about here in the second half, and granted it is the first possession, but Daniel Franks, the tight end, who was so effective, Bubba Franks, to his friends, has been so first quarter since then, they haven't gone back to it. Good opportunity here for some play action to get him the ball in the middle of the field, because you know he's going to get one-on-one -on -one coverage. So it is second down and about eight yards to go. Franks with three catches and 32 yards. Ryan Clement has had an outstanding ball game. That's Carlo Joseph in motion. And Clement is forced to roll out of the pocket. He can run if he wants. There's a lot of room. He said he's going to throw long and incomplete. Intended for Daryl Jones inside the 30. Right now, Ryan Clement is second guessing himself. It's like an it's like in basketball. You, you get a situation where you say, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. Oh, good. Good. In that situation, I know that Clement probably thought to himself, look, you know, if I'd have taken off, we get the first down. Instead, he goes for the big play. Can't quite get it. A little tug on the shirt by number nine, Anthony Midget. But no call. Wake up. Wake up. It's judgment day. Wake up. <laughs> Third down and nine to go. <laughs> and there's a flag on the play. <laughs> Dead ball. Illegal substitution. Illegal substitution yeah. One of the things that happens is that the officials have been very cognizant of that throughout this season, Charlie. We've seen at least one of those call per game where they get 13 in the huddle and make a decision and have two people run off. Can't do it. And so Butch Davis and his team pay the price. Third down and 13. The line of scrimmage now at the 30. And they've got to get just shy of the 44. Got to give a lot of credit to the offensive line of the Hurricanes. Blaze, Calleas, Wayner, Wise, and Sampson. They've done a great job of protecting, protecting Clement up to this point. Two flankers up to the top of the screen on the right side, and there is more motion. Robert Sampson, the left tackle. That's the second time he's done this, and the advice that the youngster should get from his coach is simply to say, hey, you know what? If you're not sure of the snap count, use your peripheral vision and watch where the ball is going. Instead, he tries to anticipate and cost his team another five yards. And so now third down and 18, and all that does is energize this crowd of 50,000-plus in Blackburn. Boy, it is football weather tonight. It's a brisk wind. It's cold but not oppressively so third and 18 Clement firing long over the middle Come on, what a catch what a courageous catch Santana Moss certainly on third and very long this is the right defense you go with the two deep let him throw it underneath instead he gets it in the seam the protection is outstanding and then right in the seam Moss goes up he knows he's going to get hit here watch the seam route right there he goes up in the air and gets absolutely whacked but he holds on to the ball what a tremendous catch Eon Carpenter make the tackle along makes the tackle along with Anthony Midget first and ten 
Bridger and James gets nothing. He loses a couple on the play. Charlie, it, obviously it's easy to coach up here, and I enjoy doing it every Saturday. But when you've had a big play like that, you've got the defense on the heels, why not come back with a play action or air it out? You know that the Hokies are frustrated. They gave up a third and very long. Come back with another big play. See if they're see if they're concerned about the previous play and catch them off guard instead of running up the middle. I don't know. Santana Moss came to Miami with a scholarship, all right. It's a track and field athlete. Came to Florida, Miami, as a running back or as a walk-on, and passes out of bounds and incomplete. Daryl Jones, the intended receiver. Go back to Santana Moss for a minute. He was a Florida high school champion last year in the long jump, the 400 meters, the 800 meters, and he figured, okay, let's give it a whirl in football. So he's more than just a kid who can run fast. Two catches, 65 yards tonight. Pretty decent average per catch, huh? Virginia Tech is going to play the field position game, I believe, and put them back there, but don't forget to give them an extra opportunity. Clement took advantage of it, remember, on third and 19. This is about to be Miami's 10th penalty of the night. scrimmage is all the way back to the 34 yard line. Do you, do you sense Charlie a little nervousness in the crowd as if to say well these aren't this isn't Miami of old now here in the middle of the third quarter shouldn't it be a bigger score. We should be beaten up on these guys especially with Syracuse having beaten Boston College earlier. The Hokies can ill afford another loss. Edger and James. Edger and James. Edger and James into Virginia Tech territory at the 47 yard line. 19 yards. Take a look at the block at the point of attack. Take a look out here. Look at that number 70, 79 Curlin Blaze creates the big hole for Green who cuts up field. Great job of Hang hanging with his man. Take a look right here. Take a look. Just hangs with him the entire time. Pushes him out. Enables Green to get past. That's a great job by the Miami right tackle. And so now suddenly it's third down and five to go. Jones and Wayne are the flankers. Clevin is unable to unload, and Carlo Joseph has a first down at the 40-yard line. Clement doing a great job here. They come with the blitz. Smith comes completely untouched, but he knows who his hot man is, and in this case, it's Joseph that he knows is not going to be covered. Take a look as he's going to come up field. Nobody stays with him. He gets the ball off a little bit late and a little bit too deep in coverage. In that case, was Priolo, and the result is a first down for the Canes. First and 10 at the 40-yard line. Carlo Joseph. in the backfield and Miami's going to call themselves a timeout. And we're going to take a break. 17-13 Hokies. ESPN2's presentation of college football is brought to you by Acura. The true definition of luxury. Yours. And by AXA and Equitable. A global powerhouse. A trusted friend. A formula for success. First and 10 for the Miami Hurricanes. They trail 17 to 13, and on this current drive, they've traveled 40 yards despite 23 yards in penalties. But Show they're advancing the ball. Shows a lot of resilience. They say the youth is resilient. This team, as we've documented, is very young. First and 10 at the Hokey 40. Here's Clement throwing down the sideline and incomplete. Intended for Reggie Wayne. Now here's Carl Revich. Carl. Hi, Chaz. Just a quick recap of the best game of the day so far. Number one, Nebraska up against the wall. Down a touchdown. Scott Frost, last play of the game. Chevin Williams off his foot. Great catch by the true freshman, Matt Davison. That tied it. Frost scores a touchdown in overtime. They win. Michigan can lay claim to number one as they laid wood on Penn State. Charlie? The immaculate reception. Nebraska and Missouri. Wow. 
Second down and ten here for the Hurricanes. They're trailing by four, but they're hanging tough. Here's Clement. He's in trouble. Down he goes all the way back at the 45-yard line. That was Pearson Prelo. That's his first sack of the season. Virginia Tech decides to rush with seven this time. Take a look out here. Here they come. He comes on the on, on the delayed blitz, rather. Here's Prillo. He's able to fight through the tight end who does a poor job of blocking. Nonetheless, that's the first time, really, the production, protection has broken down for Miami. Pearson Prelo, standing still, has a vertical jump of 43 and a half inches. Uh, come on. You have to prove that to me visually. I think we're going to get to that before the night is out. Ah. On third and 24. Clemens down again. That time it was Kerwin Hairston. And for Hairston, his third sack of the season. Gets the opportunity, just as we were talking about, that the protection had not broken down. This time it does twice. Gaines do a poor job, and here's a quick kick. Andy Crosland's punt will drop dead at the 25-yard line. Two sacks have energized this crowd in Blacksburg, and now the Hokies take over. Right now, Pearson Prelo, the man for Virginia Tech. Charlie mentioned he jumps 43 and a half inches. First, let's take a look at his speed on the outside, bull rushing and sacking the quarterback. Now, you want to see the vertical? Here it is, standing. He's 5'11", he reaches 7'6". On that jump, he touched 11'1 and a half. If it's a jump ball, Prelo gets it. Back to you guys. I couldn't do that on a step ladder. Um, but I'm sure a lot of people will ask. <laughs> and they'll get the same response. No shot, pal. First and 10 at the 25. And here's Lamont Pegues with his first carry of the day. And he's knocked out at the 31-yard line, a pickup of about five on the play. What we had talked about is a little bit more speed to the outside, and that affords Virginia Tech the opportunity to run both in and out. Pegues, a speedster, a transfer from Clemson, had a 100-yard game earlier. See his burst of speed. He trusts that speed, gets to the outside for a five-yard game. Pegues, who had 100 yards last week, against Alabama Birmingham. He had a 100-yard game at Clemson three years ago. Second down and four. Here's McGee's. And he nearly busted it, but he did get enough, it looks like, for the first down. Eugene Ridgely, the free safety, made the tackle. I'm not going to say that there's a rhythm that you get caught up into defensively so you can't adjust to a faster man. But what happens here is with the fresh legs and knowing that he has a limited opportunity, Pegues is going to do everything he can to make the most of that opportunity. And the result is his intensity, getting upfield, showing some speed, and doing everything he can. Virginia Tech 188 yards on the ground tonight. And the snow flurries are coming back. So many times, Charlie, with a tailback, you get a guy who's going to pace himself because he knows he's going to carry 30. Obviously, in this case, that's not what's going to happen with Pegues. Looks like a little more than Flores now, doesn't it? First and 10 at the 35. On the option, Clark's going to take it himself. Clark has got himself a first down to the 46-yard line. Now, Carl Ravitch. Charlie, light rain falling in Carolina as they kicked off of Florida State, North Carolina. Here's the first touchdown of the game. Thad Busby, Melvin Pearsall, that made it 7-zip. State has the ball now, and they are marching. Charlie? And here, Virginia Tech leads by four, and there's a flag on the play back at the line of scrimmage. Interesting discussion with regards to Florida State and North Carolina. A uh, very cogent point brought up by the people in the studio was... Holding offense, 10 yards, spotted a foul, remains first down. That although it appears that North Carolina is certainly capable, an outstanding football team, you and I had the opportunity to broadcast the North Carolina State game, they have not been in this situation before. They have not been in a game of this magnitude, whereas Florida State's very used to it. It is now first down and 19 yards to go. Pegues is deep back in the I formation. This time it is the up back Marcus Parker, and he picks up about seven on the play before Michael Smith, the linebacker, makes the tackle. 
not to dwell on the fatigue factor for defense, but it appeared, Charlie, that he was going to get tackled for a loss. He does make the nice 360 move to cut up field, but that ended up being like a five-yard game when it should have been nothing. Just running through some of those arm tackles. There is a 30-pound weight disparity, average per man, as opposed to the Virginia Tech offensive line, as compared with the defensive line of Miami. Second and 14. Mark's going to throw it this time. Fire it. He completes it to Ken Handy, his first catch of the night. About three yards short of the first down, Jeff Popovich made the tackle. Small point here, but I don't think I've ever been in a game where you had two wide receivers who are both numbered 48. You got Handy and Moss, both of the wide receivers. A very strange number for a wideout. Handy does a great job of coming back to the ball and getting his arm underneath. Those are the balls that a lot of times, Charlie, when the official is screened, will call incomplete. But he does a great job getting his hands underneath to let the official know, yes, he had it. And 46 was an unusual number from tight end, too. Third and inches, and it looks like Miami has given Virginia Tech a freebie. Damian Lewis jumped across the line of scrimmage. Well, certainly Todd Washington is going to say, I didn't make any movement. But once again, you have to be disciplined. And you can see Butch Davis very frustrated with the fact that Lewis may have been aggressive, but too much so. Todd Washington, the center, is going to make a movement, you would notice. He's 6'3 and 317. <laughs> Very good point. Is that like he could fool anybody in the middle? No, sir. <laughs> Ike Charlton checks into the lineup now. Charlton is six foot and 196, and that is Todd Washington. 6'3, 317. Brother TJ was a tackle last year on the ball club. And Bob must have been a heck of a cook. Here's Charlton. And Charlton is down. Is there a fumble? Apparently not. Or there is a flag on the play, however. Charlton is, Ch Charlie, you pointed it out at the, at the outset that this is the young man that they feel is kind of their Charles Woodson. Personal foul against Miami. You're beginning to get a sense that the youthful Hurricanes are becoming unglued and there is an injury down on the field it's Michael Smith the linebacker number 59 being attended to Smith a sophomore dead ball personal foul defense lay hit after the run 15 yards assessed and then the run first down so Smith appears to be okay but that's, but, a, that's a huge penalty. Oh, now, the Hurricanes, who had the halftime lead, are playing back on their heels. See at the end of the play, the late hit. Charlton breaking tackles. He gets tackled right there. There it is. Oh, he led with his head. Yeah. Unfortunately, it appeared to be Nate Brooks. Virginia Tech. 28-yard line, Lamont Pegues is a deep back in the eye formation. And here is Pegues. He's got some room, and he's going to go. For Lamont Pegues, his fifth touchdown of the year. 27 yards, and the Hokies lead by 10. Right side of the offensive line was outstanding for Virginia Tech. It's kind of a delayed draw. It takes an awful lot of time to get in the ball, which shows you how the offensive line is so effective. McGee's with his blazing speed, has one little crease, takes advantage of it, and goes the distance. And now Shane Graham for the extra point tries. Lamont McGee's the junior and the transfer from Clemson with the touchdown the extra point and suddenly it's the Hokies leading by 11. Gennaro DiNapoli and Brad Baylor are the ones that create the big chasm for Pugis. Just pushing the Canes backward allowing Pugis to cut back against the grain and boy his average per carry has got to be pretty good doesn't it? Take a, take a look right here get a chance to see DiNapoli and Baylor are going to shove get a double team block 
Now watch, watch what happens here as he cuts back against the green. Look at the quickness right there. Before, in fairness to Ken Oxendine, I'm not sure he would have gone the distance, but Pagese shows blazing speed, and as we pointed out, some fresh legs. Capping off a seven-play, 75-yard drive. But Charlie, as you've documented frequently throughout the telecast, there is a domination on the part of size advantage for Virginia Tech, and now here, very late in the third quarter, it's showing some dividends. Two possessions, two touchdowns as Virginia Tech trailing 13-10 at the half, now leading 24-13. Now, do you ask yourself the question, why didn't he come in earlier? <laughs> well, Oxendine kind of wore him down, and yep. Geese came in to clean it up. And a kick that is way deep into the end zone where Santana Moss will put one knee to the ground. So Virginia Tech comes up large here in the first part of the second half. Cullen Hawkins with the touchdown. Big sack by Hairston. And then the touchdown by Lamont Piggy. Charlie Steiner along with Todd Christensen and Chris Barlow and we welcome you back to the fourth quarter here in Blacksburg where the home team Hokies were trailing 13 to 10 at the half but two unanswered touchdowns in the third quarter has given the Hokies a fairly comfortable 11 point lead. Now let us see with Ryan Clement and the offense of the Miami Hurricanes can do. James Jackson is in the backfield and the pass is nearly picked off the intended receiver Santana Moss defensed on the play by Pearson Prelo. Well Prelo now is the big star. He gets the sack and he gets the pub. He gets the vertical and now he's covering the receivers. Having a good game. Second down and ten. Prelo from Alvin, South Carolina, making his 21st consecutive start. And he has come up large tonight. Second and ten. Hand off. Jackson gets nothing. Maybe two. There's Prelo again. Comes up. The defensive line had stripped them of their pulling guard, and they only had the one guy that came out. And as a result, you can see that the Prelo is completely unblocked. Well, maybe not. Oh, yeah. Not enough to stop him. Well, Wise didn't put enough, enough wood on him. Wise, 275. Prelo, 186. Third down and eight. And the crowd is now certifiably into it. It's going to throw on the run. Nearly picked off again. This time it was Lauren Johnson who defends the play. It will be fourth down. It was very close to interference. Very close to interference right here at the bottom. Take a look and see if the collision occurred before he had a chance to get the ball. Johnson on top of it. it certainly looked like he might have hit him early. The punt. Fielded by Larry Green down at the 32 yard line. And so the momentum has switched toward the home team. And Butch Davis has his work cut out. So, what is a hokey? The answer goes all the way back to 1896 when Virginia Ar Agricultural and Mechanical College changed its name to Virginia Polytechnic Institute. They had a contest, and a senior by the name of O.M. Stull won the first prize for his old hokey that's great <laughs> for his old hokey cheer and it went something like this <laughs> all right hokey 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 high tech tech vpi yeah. and that all is right. a hokey you the man you the man <laughs> i what? got through it lounge jack appearing eight times a week <laughs> don't forget to tip your wages hokey hokey high <laughs> There's more to this uh, cheer that we'll get to as I'm waiting with the evening <laughs> progresses. First and ten at the 32-yard line. So there really is no such thing as a hokey. It is just part of a cheer that's 100 years old. So what's up? Pagese only gets the three carries. Oxendine is back. 
And he's gonna rumble and get back to the line of scrimmage and not much else. Leonard Myers came up from the right cornerback spot along with Matt Sweeney. And Lamont Pegues will now watch for a while. Three carries for 37 yards and a touchdown. Not a bad night's work, although you would think that after the way he ran last time, he'd be given another opportunity, but clearly Vatek at this point wants to beat some people up and go with their big back. Leonard Myers, who made the tackle, paid for it. And he is being attended to. So the feeling was coming into this game that Virginia Tech would just try to beat down an undermanned defensive front of Miami. And it would appear that their game plan slowly but surely is coming to fruition. 222 yards of rushing. On 38 carries, which is roughly about six yards a carry. And uh, that this defensively, that just is not a good thing. But give the offensive line of Virginia Tech credit. Derek Smith, Dwight Vick, Todd Washington, Gennaro DiNapoli, Brad Baylor, and Sean Sullivan, the tight end, have been outstanding in clearing the holes for Oxendine. Parker and Pegues. Smith weighs 297, Vic 303, Washington 317, DiNapoli 296, and Baylor 298. They are a load, and that allows Lamont Pegues the opportunity to run wild as he did in the third quarter. And Ken Oxendine has been the real workhorse tonight. As the clock continues to run now. Oxendine, 23 carries for 118 yards. Second down and nine. Here's Oxendine again. Cuts, and he's got some room. Oxendine brought down across the 40. Very close to the first down. Dan Morgan made the tackle. Morgan gives away 18 pounds to Oxendine. And Morgan is the linebacker. Again, this shows the effectiveness of the offensive line that affords Oxendine the luxury of picking his hole. Right here, he's not sure. Bounces in, bounces out, but has the time to come back in because his friends up front are knocking people down. Pickup of not quite 10. Or it may be precisely 10, and that's why they're going to have a measurement. Ken Oxendine with his fifth 100 yard rushing performance of the season. Last year, 19 carries for 89 yards in the win at Miami. And they got the first down. Last year, he led the Big East in touchdowns with 13, despite the fact that he missed two games. What's interesting about the Virginia Tech offense with scales out, Oxendine and the right guard, Gennaro Dinopoli, are the only starters from last year playing in the same positions that they did last year, this year. First and 10 from the 42. Clark coming back for a gimpy knee has played the entire game and played well. Pitch out to Oxendine, running right, cutting, and getting maybe a yard or two on the play. Nate Webster, reserve linebacker, made the tackle. Give credit to Miami here hanging in there, pursuing. It looked like there was a big hole, had an opportunity for a bigger game, but it closed quickly. Which Davis has the team speed here on defense, but he just doesn't have the big people. As you pointed out, Charlie, you know, he's got a lot of guys that can fly around, but they're all like 218, 225, 215. And against a big team like Virginia Tech, it's a big disadvantage. And playing 25 freshmen this year. Clark is 8 of 9 for 99 yards. This time, the handoff to Oxendine and maybe gets to the line of scrimmage. Sutton makes the tackle. Sutton came in and just did not respect the pass at all, and why should he at this point? Third to battle left. Frank Beamer now in his 11th season. He has coached at Virginia Tech longer than any football coach has here at Blacksburg. He has won more games than anybody else here. And his team has won 14 of his last 15 here at home at Lane's. And Clark is smeared behind the line of scrimmage. Danny Fortney makes the tackle along with Chad McGeese. Hall of Fame inductee. Happy man. He's he's certainly somebody who has established himself here, and there he is as a player. You see a Vatek defensive back there for three years. Played with the Hokies in their Liberty Bowl appearances in 1966 and again in 68. 
So on fourth down, Jimmy Kibble will punt it away. Kibble with a high left-footed boot. It's going to bounce. Out of bounds at the 22-yard line. And the Hokies are sitting pretty. ESPN 2's presentation of college football is brought to you by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. The BMW storyline of the night. Miami has killed itself with 106 penalty yards. Ryan Clemens has performed nobly. And Virginia Tech has been running, running, and then some. Ox and dive. Fifth. 100 yard plus rushing performance of the night and they are just wearing down the Miami defense. So following in the storyline I can't help but think does coach Beamer drive a Beamer. <laughs> Very nice. And here's the handoff to James Jackson. Jackson's down the sideline. Jackson may bust this baby and he will. James Jackson. Touchdown Miami. 78 yards. James Jackson, who averaged 7.7 .7 yards per carry, 78 yards, and Miami is right back in it. Wow, some speed, and of course here at 24 to 19, they're going to have to go for two to get within three points. He had a he had another gear, Charlie. He had another gear. 5'11", 215 pound freshman. He just blew it open around left end. They call him the James Gang, Edgerin James and James Jackson. And this time it was the freshman's turn. And Miami's going for the deuce. Big conversion here, big conversion. Jones in motion. Flag on the play. Throw into the end zone. Did he get it? No. They bobbled it. Flag on the play. There was motion in the backfield, Charlie. The tailback Jackson moved. The tailback moved while the man went in motion. And so even though he would have caught it, it doesn't matter because it would have come back. And so the extra point is no good. And Miami is back within five. James Jackson blew it. The amazing speed of Jackson again. You got a situation to where somebody who hasn't played a lot. Watch at the point of attack here and watch right when he gets out here. It appears that some of these people have an angle, but they just cannot match the speed. Take a look at Jackson. Now he gets outside. Good block. Now right here, some people appear to have an angle, but they just can't do anything with him. Picks him up and lays him down, and that's great speed because, Charlie, I can attest to the fact that when you have to carry the football, you're not as fast as those people that don't have to carry one. Take a look to the right of your screen. Good blocking at the point of the attack. Jackson gets outside, and the rest right here is foot speed. Good job of cutting right there to maintain his balance in bounds. A lot of times you see running backs that can't do that, and they slide out of bounds. Jackson able to do it and go the distance, 78 yards. Man, he won it like Secretariat, going away. Man. Fourth touchdown of the season for James Jackson. Take a look right. Two -point I'm sorry, Charlie. Take a look right there at the tailback. He is going to move as the man is in motion. Now, see, when he shuffles right there, that's what the official sees. He throws the flag, and that negates. See, here comes the flag. That negates the play. The tight end makes the catch, but out of bounds. No conversion, and a big one for the Vatek defense because now Miami has to go for a touchdown. In the last three games coming into tonight, James Jackson has averaged 10.8 yards per carry. That's good. And here's Charlton. Gets back to the 20. Next Saturday. ESPN continues his coverage at 550 with Damian Craig leads the Tigers into an SEC battle against Robert Edwards and the ninth ranked Bulldogs. All the action next Saturday. Big game in the SEC. And so here comes Virginia Tech. Let's see how they respond to James Jackson's 
78 yard touchdown run. Oxendine in the I formation, the deep back. And he gets nothing. Here's Carl Ravage. Carl? Hi, Charlie. Speaking of nothing, the Florida State defense giving up nothing to Carolina. Meantime, Thad Busby hooking up with his favorite target. Watch the catch by E.G. Green. One handed. 14 nothing. Stayed on top of the road. The receiving core for Florida State's not too bad. Oh, man, that was a nice catch. Second down, 11 yards to go for Virginia Tech as the clock continues to run. Oxendon on the pitch out. Looking to get around the end. He can't. Gets back to the line of scrimmage, and really that's about all Cliff Jackson was in on the play. But now you begin to get, to get the sense that the young Miami Hurricanes are feeling pretty good about themselves. Leonard Myers, the corner, is the one that came up and forced the play. And Charlie, big third down conversion, obviously. But the issue here for the Hurricanes is the last couple of plays, they've had nine people in the box. They have not respected the pass at all. Certainly here at third and long, they're going to have to. Here's Clark to throw. He's in trouble. Rolling. Throwing on the run. Long, wide open. Caught down at the 35-yard line. Marcus Gildersleeve. 47 yards. When Clark breaks out and starts to run, the secondary can't decide what to do. You just saw Popovich make the wrong decision. He decided to come up and stop the run. Instead, Gildersleeve able to hang on to the ball despite the big whack from Eugene Ridgely. Clark has not thrown often, but when he has, he's been efficient. 9 of 10, 146 yards, 47 of them coming to Gildersleeve. Well, obviously, this is the advantage of a mobile quarterback because he strikes fear in the secondary that they do need to come up and run after him. And that's what happened. Popovich made the wrong decision. And Virginia Tech is going to call a timeout. And they lead by five. Eight. Jeff Popovich and Dwayne Starks were both guilty of what ended up happening here. Both of them are going to be in a situation to where they step forward. Excuse me, Popovich is back here. Now take a look. Take a look at the stop right there. Two white shirts right here are both going to step forward. And the result is, is that the long pass, people made a bad decision. And there he is wide open. And that's, that's the disadvantage that, disadvantage that you have. You can see Clark is waving him downfield, trying to get him the ball. That's a good adjustment by Gildersleeve, not unlike a center fielder who turns his back on the ball, still able to come out and make the catch. And he took a pop for his efforts. And Virginia Tech now. First and ten at the Miami 35-yard line. Each team with two timeouts left. Hand off to the up back Marcus Parker and gets back to the line of scrimmage and that's about all. Nate Webster. And Damian Lewis team up on the tackle. Obviously, Oxendine is in the game to beat up the other team, but one thing I'm surprised at at this point, Charlie, is that they don't huddle up, take some more time off the clock. Obviously, that's what they want to do because they've been snapping the ball here with about 9 and 10 seconds instead of getting an opportunity to get in the huddle and hike it when it gets down to about 2 or 1. And here's Clark to throw this time. Down the sideline. Gildersleeve. has got a touchdown! No, he dropped it. He dropped it. He dropped it. Oh, doctor. Leonard Myers, oh, he runs the out and up, and Leonard Myers at the end strips him. Watch right here. Certainly a catchable ball. Right between the one and the five, right there. Strips the ball, and it comes out. Some now, the play. big debate there would be as to whether or not he crossed the line and he had control. The official right on top of it says no. Leonard Myers with a touchdown saving swipe. Man. Now obviously we're in slow motion, so it may not be the time factor. Here, one, two, doesn't quite have it. There's the strip as he goes down. I think that given in actual time, the officials made an excellent call. Third and ten. Clement to Oxendine. Cuts at the 35. Still on his feet at the 30 and finally brought down at the 27, but still well short of the first down. 
Well, I think here, Charlie, given the circumstances, to force the guy to kick a 45-yard field goal here, fourth and about two and a half, I'm guessing that they're going to go for it. Well, they're going for a field goal is what they're going to do. Huh. Well, that shows how much I know. Shane Graham is on. His longest is 46. Uh -huh. This is a 45-yard try. The holder, Caleb Hurd, is his cousin. They've been going to school together since they were four years old. All in the family. From 45. Got it! Graham and cousin Caleb. There's a flag, a flag on the play. Now this will be an interesting decision for Coach Frank Beamer. Does he want to take points off the board and keep the ball, or does he want to take the three? This is going to be interesting what he decides to do. You gotta take the points. Uh, I'm not so sure. You gotta take the points. Uh, no, no, no. Well, let's see. Plus, he's gonna take some time off the clock. Gennaro DiNapoli, what's up, coach? Come on, what do you want to do? This is a big decision. Giving back points. And the referee John Smith is saying, come on, somebody make a decision. They're gonna take it. Let me let me just say this because it's kind of fun. I'm right. I'm right. Nana, nana, nana. <laughs> <laughs> There's the kick. He really blasts it right there at the end. He certainly does. It's incidental because he does get blocked into it. In that case, that was number 23, Dwayne Starks. But you got to call it. The official does, and I'm really not surprised. This does he get blocked into it? No, he certainly doesn't. That's a good call by the official. Right, that's a fine acting job too. It is. Well, he gave will, back he, he will work well in Raleigh. He gave back points. Let's see how this works out for Virginia Tech. Here's Oxendine. No point in running out of bounds. You want to keep the clock going. And no gain on the play. One of the things here is that with Pegues out of the game, they've lost that speed to the outside that they had. And again, you know, not to second guess Coach Beamer, but certainly in the fourth quarter, the Vatek offense has been flat with the exception of the one big play. And I don't understand why that guy isn't in the game. Oxendine beginning to show signs of wear and tear, isn't he? Can't imagine that Pegues is too tired with only three carries. Second down and ten. So he traded three points for three down. I don't think he got the playoff. And a penalty against Virginia Tech. Boy, now the crowd is getting hostile. You took three points off the board. Now you're going backwards. Five-yard penalty remains second down. And now it's just a five-point game. It would have been an eight-point lead. It's even there, Charlie. You have to know what Coach Beamer's thinking is, and that is that means that Miami is still within one score of tying the game. I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence with the math, but sir, have an opportunity the way you've been running the ball nearly 250 yards. And you take the penalty and see what you can do. This is a game Virginia Tech simply cannot afford to lose. Second and 15. Oxendine still on his feet to the 22-yard line, so he gets back to the original line of scrimmage, and that's about it. Third down, and maybe nine. Once again, the ball carrier. With Syracuse winning tonight, beating Boston College, Virginia Tech must continue to win and keep ahead of Syracuse for a very rich postseason bowl appearance. There's an injury on the field to a Virginia Tech player. It is the big oh, offensive center Todd Washington. Washington. Uh oh. Yeah, it looks like a shoulder. Now Charlie, here, here, this is this is a pretty big deal, particularly if they go to the shotgun. Is Keith Short going to be able to come in ice cold and make the delivery? Keith Short is merely 50 pounds lighter than Todd Washington. Washington 317 the backup center Keith short is 267 and now it is third down and nine Here's Clark. Gonna run it. He's got some room 
And he's got a first down to the 11-yard line. Dan Morgan made the tackle. A pickup of 11. Even though Clark does not have you know, the foot speed that he has had earlier in the season due to the knee injury, he certainly has great instincts. Once again, the protection is outstanding. He rolls right. There's nothing there. Look at the middle of the field. Look at all the grass right here. There's nobody to come up and make a play, and Clark tucks it under his arm. As you pointed out, Charlie, able to get just enough for the first. His eighth carry of the night for 39 yards. And Virginia Tech can still get another first down. First and 10 for the 12. Here's Oxendine right up the gut. Down to the five-yard line. On third and nine, the quarterback getting that big first down. Boy, that saves the world a second guessing, doesn't it? It certainly does. And again, there's a situation where the clock, Clark doesn't need to be in a hurry. 17, 16. They need to bleed some time off. And Charlie, I really think that's another consideration with regards to the points. They certainly wanted to take as much time off the clock as they could. Each team with two timeouts left. Oxen down again. To the line of scrimmage and maybe gain the yard. Here's the opportunity for them, Charlie, to run the option. They have not run the option maybe once in the entire second half. For them to come down the line, especially the way Clark has been running, they can get a first down at about the one and a half. I think that would be a great call here. Now, Clark getting his marching orders from the Virginia Tech sideline. Parker and Oxendine in the I formation. Third and four at the five. Oxendine cuts and gets nothing. Chad Pegues, who was injured earlier in the game, comes up with a big-time tackle. Really was. That is a big-time play there. Oxendine, it appeared, had a had an opening, cuts back against the grain, but Pegues is right there. And Butch Davis is very cognizant of the fact that, hey, you know what? They'll kick this field goal if they make it. No big deal. We did lose some time. It'll be under about four minutes when we get the ball back, but we're still within one score. And so... Cousin Caleb Hurd will be holding for Shane Graham. And he's got it from 22 yards. And now the Hokies with an eight-point lead. And Miami has two timeouts left. Shane Graham and his 22-yard field goal. This year he is 11 out of 11 from inside the 40. Very impressive, it's at the collegiate level in particular. Even more impressive, a seven minute and one second drive. And Virginia Tech elected to take off three points after the 45 yard field goal and it bought them an extra three and a half minutes. And the kickoff is high and very short. Fielded at the 15 yard line by Popovich. Popovich still on his feet. And finally brought down at the 34 yard line. A reminder, want to watch college football the way it was meant to be? It's the ESPN game plan. For 11.95, you'll see up to 10 great college football games every Saturday afternoon on TV that not normally would be on TV in your area. Pay for it, you got it. 11.95, 10 games every Saturday on pay-per-view. We have an injured Hokie down at the 33-yard line. Give you some idea of how and why this game is so important to Virginia Tech. They must stay in front of Syracuse if they are going to make it to the promised land and the Fiesta Bowl. Mike Charlton is the man. That's a that's a big loss right there. Charlton, arguably their best cover guy, man for man, and certainly in this drive, you know that Clement's going to be throwing. The thought about getting to the Fiesta Bowl will continue here after this play. First and ten at the 34 yard line Jackson the deep back and that is Jones in motion and Clement to throw and he gets rid of it just in the nick of time Daryl Jones and Jones is across the 40 to the 41 yard line great pursuit from the backside by Kerwin Hairston who comes all the way from his defensive tackle position to make the hit Clement taking a page out of Brett Favre's book he's about to be sacked gets the throw out Maybe should have stayed to the outside, but instead cuts back, and Hairston flying from the defensive tackle position makes the stick. But not before a pickup of seven, second down, and three. 
Clock running, and again, Miami has two timeouts left. They're going to hand it off. James Jackson. Jackson's got some room. Jackson may go. He's finally pushed out of bounds. At the 35-yard line. Poor run support on the part of Lauren Johnson enabled him to get to the outside. Take a look to the right of your screen. Number 12 is going to come up and try and make the hit. And Jackson just jukes him right there, breaks through the arm, and then the speed that you mentioned, Charlie, he almost goes the distance, but fortunately for the Hokies, Carpenter able to push him out of bounds. And he is a freshman. Averaging tonight, 19.8 yards per carry. He came into the game in his last three games averaging 10.8 yards per carry. Tonight, 19.8. Plenty of time for Miami. And here's Jackson again. Jackson inside the 25 and down at the 22. Steve Tate made the tag. We documented the fatigue factor for the Miami defense, but right now, Charlie, is the body English of the Hokies would seem to indicate they're the ones that are a little bit tired, too. As they have an injured player on the field, and they're just, they're arm tackling. Right cornerback, Anthony Midget, number nine. Bud Foster, the defensive coordinator, has all his defenders over there trying to tell them, hey, look, you know what? We're deep into the game here, 252 left. We can't arm tackle. They got plenty of time to run the ball. We're going to take a break. Miami's on the move. Time left, too. The fourth quarter alone, James Jackson, four carries for 117 yards. Wow. First and 10, Miami at the 23. Here's Jackson. He's not going anywhere this time. Part of the problem there, Charlie, is that Miami opted to go with just the one wide out and two tight ends set with two backs in the backfield. That certainly isn't a throwing formation. And as a result, Virginia Tech was able to cram eight, nine people into the box. And the clock continues to run. I really don't think the clock is a factor here, Charlie. I mean, 219 and running. Assuming this is their last opportunity, which it probably is. And they've got two timeouts. Jackson is the deep back in the I formation. Clemens going to throw. Sideline complete. Jones inside the 15-yard line. Great effort by Jones stretching forward, and it might be just enough. There's a situation where they decide to trick them. They go with the same situation, which is only the one wide receiver. Jones takes a look like he might be running it up. Instead, he shortens it, comes back, and makes the catch. And I'm surprised there that Ike Charlton, once again, remember, he's the one that got hit on the kickoff earlier. He's obviously showing some fatigue. Now the measurement for the first down. Now, why is this game so important to Virginia Tech? If they can hold on and win out their remaining three games of the season and stay in front of Syracuse, they will go to the Fiesta Bowl. What does the team get paid to go to the Fiesta Bowl? $8,640,000. They may end up at the Carquest Bowl if they lose this game. For that, Virginia Tech would make $750,000. So basically what we are seeing here in the final one minute and 58 seconds and 13 yards is $8 million riding on the line. James Jackson, the deep back, gets the handoff. He's got some room, and he's going to score! What a great block by the fullback in that play. Number 40, Carlo Joseph just cleared a path, and there's no decision here. Obviously, they're going to go for two. You saw... You saw Butch Davis sprint over to his offensive coordinator. They may come back to what they had earlier and throw the ball to their tight end, who had been so effective earlier in the game. Take a look at Bubba Franks, number 88. Virginia Tech season, at least in terms of going to an Alliance Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, may well ride on this two-point conversion. But just as I say, Franks, he comes out of the game. Mondrell Fulcher reports in. Ch Charlie, they're down to 10 seconds. I think Clemens going to have to use one of the timeouts here. 
Done four, three, yeah, he's got to call timeout. And that's what he does. And since this is, this is a pretty big play, he made the right decision, even though it might cost him later on. You'd love to have that extra timeout, but this is such a huge play. James Jackson, some kind of star. Call. Take a look at the blocking at the point of attack here. Fatigue has set in for Virginia Tech. Watch the fullback's lead block here. Look at the tight. Oh, man, he just stuffs Lauren Johnson, and that enables Jackson to get outside and go into the end zone untouched. What a great fourth quarter he's having. Nine carries, 143 yards, and two touchdowns. 128 of those 143 coming in the fourth quarter. And you saw Mondrell Fulcher, the tight end, also with a terrific block, hooking the outside backer. And now, Charlie, you mentioned the dollar figure. I was about to point out that money can't buy happiness, but I'm pretty sure Virginia Tech's looking to rent. So right here, two-point conversion is an $8 million conversion. Of course, Virginia Tech, if Miami should tie, gets the ball back and has two timeouts left. I'm not sure, Charlie, I, I, I know this sounds funny, youth will be served. I'm not sure that the Hokies have the advantage in the overtime because I see some genuine fatigue here on the part of Virginia Tech's defense, and Jackson's only getting better. It was supposed to be the other way around. Yep. And so now for the two-point conversion. It may be a two-point conversion, all right. But it nearly went two points the other way. Pearson Coilo with the interception. And what a night he has had. What they're trying to do is they're trying to run a pick play. But what Prillo does is that he does not fight. He stays in his spot. He doesn't run after a receiver. Take a look. You're going to see the receivers are going to come down and try and make a pick. Prillo stays where he's supposed to. And Clement hits him right in the chest. Watch the receivers come down here and try and pick people and try and get a person to the outside. But watch Prillo just sit in the middle. He doesn't follow anybody. He sits in his zone. Sits right here. Sits right here, and he's right in front, and he would have gone the distance except for the fact that Jackson is probably the fastest player on the field, and he runs him down. And once he got there, they are beating him to death. Well, there it is. Sits right there, and right there, Virginia Tech is awfully happy, but of course, we're awaiting the onside kick. As we mentioned, Jackson with fresh legs, number 21 runs him down. Butch Davis. And Pearson Prelo, the junior from Alvin, South Carolina, making his 21st straight start, has been one of the outstanding performers tonight. And he was chased down by another outstanding performer, James Jackson. And so the onside kick is on its way. And they've got 10 guys. Virginia Tech does. Hands team. All, All guys that can catch. At the 45 to 50 yard line. And Miami has one timeout left. As the ball touched a little bit early. See right there. It certainly is. Yes, if he got it was. He got touched a little bit early by number 23, Dwayne Starks. Wayne comes up with the ball. Big play. And let's but see. The official if they caught it. He did. did. Oh, 50,000 folks here in Blacksburg are breathing a collective sigh of relief. Well, if 
Butch could see the replay we're about to show you. Well, Butch is upset because of the fact. Now, take a look at Starks right here. Now, watch the ball. Does it alter its course? Watch the left hand. It certainly does. It did alter its course. It was a good call by the official. I think the beef that Butch Davis had, Charlie, was the official did not call it right away. But after talking about it in conferencing, he opted to do it. But nonetheless, it was the right call. It certainly was. And here's Ken Oxendine. And Oxendine gets maybe a couple. He's met by the interior of the line of Miami, and they're going to take their last time out. With a minute 35 to go. Pearson Prelo with the interception protecting that two point lead. One time, I got to go talk to my coach right quick. I got to talk. Hi, mom, grandma. I talk to my coach, baby. We love you, baby. <laughs> Mom takes second second stage to the coach. Very impressive. Meanwhile, Butch Davis talking to his defenders, Cliff Jackson and Eugene Ridgely. They have played a gutty ball game tonight. Problem here, Charlie, is that if ever there was a team constructed to run out the clock, it's got to be Virginia Tech with all those big bodies, 225-pound tailback. Miami's got to hope for a turnover. What a remarkable performance tonight by James Jackson, freshman running back from Miami. He single-handedly brought the Hurricanes back into this one. Second down and nine with a minute 35 to go. You know what they say, they can't teach speed. <laughs> Man, he was fast. If they could, he'd be a PhD. Reminded me 21 when he was in the open field of a 21 I used to play with named Cliff Branch who mm -hmm. uh, had some pretty good wheels. And number 20. 20. Pearson Frelo with more television time. You back on with me? <laughs> yeah, we're back on. It's more for everybody back in Alvin, South Carolina. You're up there representing. Hi, Grandma. I love you. I hope you're feeling good. Everybody in the barbershop, I love you all, too. I'm coming home one day, baby. <laughs> all right. The barbershop, huh? The hangout place. Second down. And a long eight. Oxendine is the deep back in the eye formation. And now Clark is going to call it on Oxendine. Oh, he nearly found himself the seam as is. He gets to the 35-yard line. It'll be third and about two. The National Car Rental Players of the Game had to be James Jackson from Miami. Nine carries, 142 yards, two touchdowns, and defensively Pearson Prelo, six tackles, and that intercepted two-point conversion attempt that pretty well put this game on ice, barring a turnover. And that was the only turnover of the game. Third down, and a long two. Oxendine's got the first down, and that's the ball game. So now all Virginia Tech has to do is have their quarterback, Al Clark, put his knee to the grass once or twice, and that's it. Oxendine will finish the night with 36 carries and 147 yards. Frank Beamer and the Hokies are breathing one big sigh of relief, and they will remain ahead of Syracuse in the polls. Well, Butch Davis has to be happy. I, I know that there's no such a thing as moral victories, and we're rebuilding and we're struggling, et cetera, but they gave the Hokies all they could handle. They came within that two-point conversion. And I think that he's got to be very happy with the development of these young people. And, and as everybody knows, because of the youth, they're only going to get better. 25 freshmen have played for Butch Davis this year. 15 true freshmen. Seven true freshmen have started. Prior to his arrival, five true freshmen had started at Miami in the past 15 years. So Virginia Tech will come away with the win, improve their season record to 7-2, and two, continue to lead the Big East. And Frank Beamer, his team will have a week off. And then they visit Pittsburgh and finish up at Virginia. That's a wrap from Blacksburg. Final score once again. Virginia
Virginia Tech 27 and Miami 25 for Todd Christensen and Chris Marlowe. I'm Charlie Steiner saying so long. This